What is going on, guys? It's Tyler Breck from T1 of May. If you're watching this live, I apologize. I had some internet issues there, which might have caused a little bit of a delay for you guys. But how is everybody doing? UFC 267. All right, well, it looks like we're back now, I guess. Sorry, uh, lots of technical difficulties right out of the gate here that are just kind of out of my control. That is not a good start. You guys know me. I'm just a black cloud here. Whenever there's a pay-per-view, I, I haven't had a pay-per-view in a long time go completely fair, but how's everybody doing? Uh, so I, I apologize if the stream cuts out. It is what it is, but one of the biggest cards of the year is live and free on ESPN+. Plus. You just got to get up a little bit earlier for them there in the afternoon time, and once again, it cuts out. It, it cuts, keeps cutting out, man. I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do about it. I don't know what I'm supposed to do about it. Um, the issues have returned. Of course they have, right? Because it's a pay-per-view after all, and I just can't go through a night without... I just can't go through a pay-per-view without stuff out of my control just not working out, but dude... Okay, now that that's hopefully over and done with, um, we'll begin in the flyweight division. We have a total of 15 fights on this card, so I'm going to jump right into it. This might be a little bit of a longer preview, pending technical difficulties, man. But here we go. Lots of underdog picks on the card. Right out of the gate, there are... I, I, I'm definitely going against the grain on some of these picks. Um, definitely going against the grain, but there's a lot of favorites on this card. I mean, we're looking at minus 340. The closest odds for this fight card, I believe, is Shamil Gatsmatov, uh, and he's minus 145. Uh, beyond that, everything is pretty spread out, especially on the main card. But we'll get in the flyweight division between Alan Nascimento taking on Tagir uh, Vlanbekov, excuse me. Vlan Bekov, he's from Dagestan, Russia. Get used to that trend right there. From Dagestan, Russia, 13-1 in his MMA career with two knockouts, six submissions, and five decision victories. Alan Nascimento is from Brazil. He's 18-5, very experienced going into his UFC debut. He's, he's one of those guys that um, I'd kind of compare him to almost like a Derek Minner, um, somebody that's fought on the outside of the UFC, even though he's from Brazil. Alan Nascimento, he's fought some good promotions, has fought good talent, very experienced going into his UFC debut, and, you know, here it is, the UFC's gods are, the um, YouTube gods are jacking with you, they sh they sure are, you know why, it's because it's raining outside, and when it's raining, Boingo Wireless just, just doesn't want to, just doesn't want to work out, so, what happens is, my stream cuts out every now and then, you know what I can do is get the internet off my phone, but stick with me, I ain't going anywhere, um, you just might see it cut off every now and then. Beyond that, lots of underdogs on this card. Let's start off with the first fight. That's such a bad way to start off this card. But Tagir Ullenbekov taking on Alan Nascimento. Alan Nascimento, like I said, 18 to 5. He's a plus 260 underdog. Get used to that. That's actually quite, and like they call it a moderate underdog in the UFC. That's quite unusual seeing an underdog that, uh, a uh, plus 260 type of underdog. So I'd consider that more of a little bit higher than moderate, I guess. And Tamir, uh, Tagir, Ulanbekov, a minus 340 favorites. Looking at the topology votes, and this really puts this into perspective. 95% for Ulanbekov, 5% for Nasiamento. And I'll keep using this as a frame of reference. And perhaps there's a lot of Dan Hooker fans out there. I get it. But uh, they're definitely a lot... To put it in perspective, 18% are going with Dan Hooker in that fight, and I, I don't I don't see it. And, and even like 40% of that 18% are picking him via decision, which I, I just don't see how that's a possibility. But anyway, that's totally off track. Let's take a look at the career of Nasi Amento. He is making his UFC debut, like I said before, and he fought on Dana White's Suzuki Contender Series Brazil. Very hard to find those fights, uh, unfortunately, on Fight Pass, so I wasn't able to find it. But he lost a split decision to Holly and Paiva, which, I mean, even in a loss, that's uh, still kind of impressive. The stats in that fight uh, were relatively even. In fact, he outstruck Holly and Paiva 105 to 81, only was able to take him down one time. He's got 13 submission victories in his MMA career, and you know what also will help? Is Xing out of SureDog. SureDog's great, great re uh, resources. However, uh, it, it tanks your internet, unfortunately. And I, I'm going to exit out of some of these other tabs here, too.
But just looking through his career, I mean, he's fought in Aspera Fighting Championships, Ryzen, lost a split decision to y uh, Yuki Matoya. Von Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series, and that was back in August of 2018. And then almost three years later, took on a fellow by the name of Elviato Lima, who was 5-2 and two going into that fight in an organization that I can't even pronounce, an organization that I hadn't heard of. He had a couple of fights canceled in 2019 and into 2021 as well, but one via rear naked choke, and here he is fighting on the big, world's biggest stage on one of the biggest cards of the year, live and free on ESPN+, Plus, one of the first fights. And I, I can't quite say that his uh, UFC debut was a long time coming. Usually, with these guys, they're right up the, they're right up there, they're right up on the edge of getting a call from the UFC and not. That hasn't been the case for him. Uh, but however, in his career, he's got 13 submission victories, two triangles, and a very diverse set of submissions, by the way. Two triangles, an arm triangle, four Renegade chokes, a knee bar, two heel hooks, two arm bars, and a Dars choke. He went one of one in Legacy Fighting Championships way back when. This is before the LFA. I mean, this guy, uh, he fought in Elite, X, uh, Elite FC. Not Elite XC. Uh, my dyslexia caught up with me. Uh, this afternoon, I got really excited about that. In fact, wrote it down, and just now I'm like, oh, that's Elite FC, and it was 2013, so makes sense. But uh, early in his career in Legacy Fighting Championships, won via knee bar in round number three on the main card of that one. Pardon me. He lost the championship bout to Will Campanzano. Campanzano was, I believe, two-fight UFC veteran and a couple fights in the WEC as well. Um Took on Eddie Wideland, uh, that opponent. So he's fought some good opponents before, but that was kind of the highlight of his career up until that up until that point, and really since then, up until a split decision loss to Holly and Paiva, and then he fought once in Ryzen as well. His opponent going into this fight, Tagir Vladbekov. He's 1-0 in the UFC. He defeated Bruno Silva via unanimous decision. The only loss in his career is Jalgas Jamagula. Uh, for the Fight Nights Global 125-pound championship. In fact, he won the Fight Nights Global 125-pound championship and lost it in his first de defense to Jama Gulov. Went 4-1 and one in that promotion. And this this is a common trend throughout tonight's night. And it really is a testament to how good Russian fighters really are. Because like I, I keep saying it with the uh, semi-pro, I'm not going to call it semi-pro, but the pro professional organizations um, outside of Bellator, PFL, the UFC, Ryzen, some of those like end of the game type of MMA organizations where you just really can't get any higher than that. Um, in terms of developmental organizations, Russia's really got it made. They iron sharpens iron. Like they have ACA, Fight Nights Global, M1, and everybody's fighting really good talent. And his opponent's combined record, 99 and 31. That's averaging before prior to his UFC career an average record of eight and two. And that is, I, I can't express to you guys, you guys know I do this a lot. Lots of background research. And this is one of the stats that I love to pull up. You do not see that very often. And on this card alone, we have a handful of them. In his fight against uh, Bruno Silva, uh, he was outstruck 47 to 46. On, the, on paper, it was kind of a close fight. Uh, 69 to 59, he outstruck him in the total strike department. Took him down five times, was taken down four times in that fight. Led to a 30-27 judges scorecard for him and two judges two judges scored a 29-28 for himself as well. What we saw in this fight as well in the final couple of seconds was throwing some haymakers in the direction of Bruno Silva. It was a very entertaining fight and a very impressive performance in his UFC debut. Um, my prediction going into this fight, common trend here. I'm just going to stick with it. I'm going with the wrestlers in this one. So I'm going with Vlan Bekov, the unanimous decision. Um, Nascimento, he hasn't taken on the best of competition before. And if he can't pull off of some sort of a submission, which is great because he's got a very diverse submission game. And I haven't been able to there, I haven't been able to see much film on him, unfortunately. But just looking at his stats on paper, two triangles, arm triangle, four running chokes, knee bar, two heel hooks, two arm bars, two, and a darse choke. You don't see those types of stats very often either. So... Um, he's going to need to rely on a spontaneous submission to take to take out a guy like Vlen Bekov to win this fight. And in Vlen Bekov's UFC debut, I was very impressed with him against a tough guy in Bruno Silva. And that's the way we're starting off this card in the flyweight division. By the way, no women's fights on this card. Not a shock. We're in Abu Dhabi. We don't talk about that very much. But case in point, lots of Russians on this card. And that's, that's going to be a common trend over there in Abu Dhabi. But I think everybody recognizes that. But, unfortunately, no women's flyweight fights. It's on a t 
We're on a two-week dry spell. Last week, it was like the first card in months where they didn't have a women's slyway fight. So you guys know I love that division. Anyway, the next fight on the card is in the lightweight division. We have Demir Ismagulov taking on Magomed uh, Mustafayev. Ismagulov, one of the hotter prospects uh, coming back in 2021. Lots of name recognition there. And uh, he came back in impressive fashion. Feed Hafiel Alves via unanimous decision in his return fight. But looking at his record, he is 23-1 and in his MMA career, depending on if you look at Wikipedia or Tapology or what the UFC has to say. Because they all tend to disagree with his record. But uh, he represents Kazakhstan. Uh, he trains out of Russia. Taking on fellow Russian, Megaman Mustafayev, the sniper. Mustafayev is 14-4 and four with 10 knockouts, 4 submissions, 0 decision victories. Uh, the odds going to this fight, Mustafayev plus 210 underdog. Like I said, this is going to be a common trend. And it's Magulov minus 275 moderate favorite. And I know a lot of times when we look at a 23-1 and record, you often have to look at who the competition is. But I'll get to that in just a moment. So let's start off with Megamed Mustafaya, which I believe he has a Wikipedia page. He does. 10 knockouts in his professional career. Made his UFC debut all the way back in 2015, where he defeated Piotr Hallman via TKO and even had a victory at Dr. Stoppage over Abu Bakar Namagomedov in Sochi, Russia prior to his UFC debut, and he actually fought three times that night, September 1st, 2014, and I'm assuming won the Sochi Star Club tournament. They, they didn't elaborate further. Also won an M1 Challenge Legion Fighting Championships. That's another big organization out of Sochi, Russia. Uh, I haven't seen too many fighters coming out of the Legion fights, to be quite honest with you, so I, I couldn't quite tell you exactly his uh, background there, the kind of competition that he's facing off against there. But when you're taking out guys like Abu Bakar and Amagomedov, that's obviously some name recognition. Defeated Piotr Hallman via Dr. Stoppage as well in his UFC debut back in 2015. Defeated Joe Proctor via TKO in the first two minutes of that fight. And then lost to Kevin Lee when Kevin Lee was kind of running through the lightweight division. Uh, got rear naked choked in the second round. Was out for nearly three years and came back and spinning back kicked Hafiel Faziv. And talk about a comeback knockout victory in a minute, just a minute, 26 seconds in. And then he has a split decision loss to Brad Riddell. That was February 2020. So he's been out for a little over, or li oh, little over 18 months now. So another long layoff. But that's kind of a common trend with these Russian guys. I, I don't know why, but that's, that seems to be common. Uh, with his in his case, he had an arm injury that he sustained in the Kevin Lee fight uh, that prevented him from coming back in a timely manner and had a couple of fights fall through in, in the meantime as well. But 100% finishing rate going into this fight, three and two in the UFC. Uh, in his fight against Fazeev, he landed two of those spinning back kicks. The first one landed. And if you guys have watched Fazeev before, before you guys know how good defensively he is. So the fact that he was able to hit him with, it's more of a spinning hook kick, really, which is a very freaking hard kick to land. And even when he landed it, it landed with so much power that uh, Fazeev was able to block it, but it kind of hit the forearm and it pushed through the guard of Fazeev and actually put him down and he was able to get the finish with it. Uh, jumped on him, landed one more perfect shot and... It, Pretty much a walk-away knockout. He landed a couple of ground-and-pound shots, walked away, and then the referee stepped in. He knew he was out. So that's a freaking really impressive victory. And then they threw him to the Wolves again against Brad Riddell. Uh, was dropped with a little looping right hook on the chin in round number one and had to rely on his wrestling a lot in the latter half of that fight. Um, which, I mean, I'd say he's mostly known for his striking and he had to rely on his grappling that fight because it was Brad Riddell that got the better of him in the striking department, which there's no shame in that whatsoever. But it wasn't enough, and he ended up losing a split decision. So one of the judges gave it to him based on the control time that he had, but that only took him so far because uh, and he, even with the takedowns that he had, he didn't really do much with them. And in the times that he did have Brad Riddell controlled up against the cage, didn't do much with it. And I believe that fight was overseas as well, over there in Australia too. So uh, a little bit of a hometown factor as well for Brad Riddell in that one too. Uh, his stats in his first five UFC fights, 2.58 significant strikes landed per minute. And actually is at a deficit. He absorbs 2.68. But he's got 3.31 takedown average per 15 minutes, which is extremely high. At a 50% accuracy rate. 
and a 58% uh, 50 takedown accuracy rate, 50%, 58% significant strike accuracy rate. And now the guy that's really gotten a lot of people talking and considering how stacked this main card is, a lot of fights are flying under the radar on the uh, prelims. And this is definitely one of those prospects that uh, at one point when he made his return, everybody was talking about him. And with everything going on at the top of the card, and rightfully so, there's a lot going on up there. It's one, Like I said, it's one of the most stacked cards of the year. But we often underlook some of these some of these main card fights, and we just look at it on paper and we're like, man, um, there's just a lot of names I can't pronounce on this, so I don't really care. Football's on, what have you. That's which makes me a little bit concerned about this fight card with uh, college football in the middle of college football season. I'm not a big college football fan, but I know a lot of people are. So yeah, it's gonna be kind of tough for the UFC to get the uh, proper recognition that it deserves this week, but. That's just a total, total side note there. Demir Ismagulov. Give me two seconds here. Yeah, represents Kazakhstan, was born in Russia. But we're going back, a long career in M1 Challenge. And we have to go back to 2015 was when his last loss was, which is crazy to think that that was when... Um, his opponent, Mustafayev, made his UFC debut, and it really shows how active Ismagulov has been. Uh, lost in his third fight in M1 Challenge. Went 2-1 and one in the promotion. Now he's 8-1 and one in the promotion. And even picked up the lightweight championship, uh, knocking out Maxim Davinovich, Davinich, uh, via TK, or won that fight via TKO in the final 13 seconds uh, of round number 5. So we know he's got a good gas tank right there, just right off the bat. And defended the title two more times, going the distance in one of those fights and had a round one TKO dot, or TKO via hand injury in his final fight prior to his UFC debut. Made his UFC debut in December of 2018. And you see the very high finishing rate prior to his UFC debut. Um, has had four straight decisions. And in fact, he's kind of relied on that. Defeated Alex Gorgis via... You, via unanimous decision in his UFC debut, defeated Joel Alvarez via unanimous decision, defeated Thiago Moisés, and then Rafael Alves. And once again, look at the long layout that he had in between these two fights, August 31st, 2019. Nearly two years away, two years out from that fight, makes his return against Rafael Alves, won that fight via unanimous decision. And I actually, I haven't been able to find the reason why um, he had that long layoff, to be quite honest with you. 10-1 in his M1 global career. Uh, was the 155-pound championship there. Was actually rated the 2017 M1 Fighter of the Year. His stats going into this fight. Oh, he's a master of sport and army hand-to-hand combat as well. His stats going into this fight. In this fight, uh, with his in his first four UFC fights, 3.75 significant strikes landed per minute. Only absorbs 1.9. And keep in mind, a lot of these fights were largely standing as well. Well, some. Uh, Half of them were, I should say, were largely standing at a 43% significant strike accuracy rate, but a, a very high significant strike defense rate of 65%. 100% takedown defense rate going into this fight, uh, which will pay dividends in this one. If Mustafaev, if, if he's losing the striking exchanges, then he will rely on his grappling. And if Ismagulov can keep the fight standing, it will be very difficult for Mustafaev to win this fight, in my opinion. Uh, lands 1.76 takedowns per 15 minutes and two of in his entire UFC career so far 18 minutes and 42 seconds of total control time now he's got the distance in every single one of his fights uh, so that's an hour of fight time that he has had so in just four UFC fights he's had an hour of, of fight time and 18 of the uh, 18 minutes of those so roughly about 33 percent are him controlling his opponent. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to do that against Mustafa, but what's good about uh, Ismagulov, he's good on the feet, good on the ground. I'd say he's primarily known as a striker, but if he needs, if he has the advantage in the grappling department, he'll expose that a little bit. So I'm interested to see in these grappling exchanges, um, in the f fight against uh, Rafael Alves, in his first 10 seconds of his UFC return, he was actually on the floor. He was dropped by a right cross at the end of a flurry of shots by Rafael Alves. Uh, that was just from a wild attack, and one of those punches happened to slip through. Sent him down, but he hopped right back up. Actually won the scramble, ended up on top of Rafael Alves, and pretty much that's how the fight ended. Uh, he took it off a little bit in round number three, which makes me maybe a little bit concerned of his, of his gas tank, but he took it off a little bit. But I actually had him winning a 30-27. He ended up winning a uh, unanimous decision uh, in that one. I believe all three judges had to score 29-28 in that one. Yeah, um, 
big takedown defense, by the way, from Mega Man Boost to 5 is 50%. So uh, this will be very interesting when the fight is standing. I think it would be pretty close. This, this fight's pretty close altogether, but I do think Ismagulov has the advantage um, in a technical striking battle, which is what I think this will be, unless Mustafaev can pull off something crazy, which I think Ismagulov is good enough defensively to prevent that. So I see this fight, by the way, you'll see a lot of decisions on this card. I've watched the ACA before. There are a lot of Russians, okay? Decisions are Russian. They're just... Russians are decision mach machines. They're good fights for sure. So if you guys are wondering... I went with a lot of safe bets, to say the least, with the uh, decisions. I'm not too confident in a whole lot of these finishes. Oh, and even look, Sanhagen as a unanimous decision. All week I've been saying Sanhagen was going to get a knockout. But I'll get into that a little bit more. That fight's out lightweight between two hot prospects. I like that fight a lot. Ismagulov minus 275 favorite. Mega Man Boost to 5 plus 210 underdog, which on any other card would be pretty... Uh, pretty wide open there, but on this card, that's about as close as it'll get. Speaking of close odds that don't really make sense, Hilyo Zhang taking on Andre Petrosky, uh, 185 pounds. Petrosky taking this fight on short notice. Uh, Hilyo Zhang, three and two. He's from China, three and two in his UFC career or MMA career, that is, with uh, two knockouts and one submission victory. Andre Petrosky is from Pennsylvania, six and one in his MMA career. Lost also on the Ultimate Fighter. Four wins by knockout, two wins by submission. So 100% finishing rate for these two fighters going into uh, their and going into this fight. Petrosky opens as a minus 245 favorite. Hu Yao Zhang, plus 185 underdog. I think it should be swayed heavily in favor of Andre Petrosky. That's just my opinion. Andre Petrosky, he's 1-0 in his UFC career. He defeated Michael Gilmore via round three TKO in pretty dominant fashion. And that was back in August. Took that fight on short notice as well. He lost to Aaron Jeffrey via round two TKO in the main event of LFA 93. I even thought he was a little overqualified for the ultimate fighter uh, on that season. There was a couple of fighters that I didn't think belonged there. But a lot of those fighters that I didn't think belonged there really did did very well. And guys like Petrosky, who did belong there, um, ended up losing. Even, even though he lost in the semifinal bouts, you only need to fight twice in the house nowadays, but compared to in the old days, like think George St. Pierre against J Josh Koshik that season, they had to fight four times in the house. One, They needed to fight to get into the house, and there's 16 people in the house. So you start with 30, 32, 36, 32 that is. No, 32. Yeah, okay, I'm bad at math there. You have to fight five times over that course, over that course of time, including the finale. You only need to win twice in the house, once on the finale, and he ended up losing. He defeated Brian Battle via round one guillotine, and Brian Battle he didn't belong there. Okay, he, he did. He had a stellar career in Australian or Australian fight, Alaskan fighting championships, AFC, Alaska fighting championship. But that's just not good competition. Andre Petrosky's been there, done that. Has a great career in wrestling. I believe placed like third in state in Pennsylvania as a high schooler, and then wrestled at a couple of colleges growing up. Uh, growing up, I think his father was even a head one of the wrestling coaches at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, it was University of North Carolina. That's where Andre Petrosky uh, wrestled that. But he lost to Brian Battle via round two ninja choke in the semifinal bout. Brian Battle ended up winning the tournament. Uh, he was the Art of War cage fighting 185 pound champion. Defended it one time. Got two submissions at Kimura and one undisclosed submission. Uh, in his fight against Gilmore, he was able to grif gift wrap the arm when he was in the full mount. Bomb, bop, bop, pop, pop, lots of ground and pound. 47 consecutive shots. Um, it, it, and the rounds were actually knotted up. Um, it was 1-1 one, one going to round number three, and Petrosky really took the ball and ran with it in round number three. He's got great conditioning, very strong. If you look at him, he's a physical specimen. Hu Yao Zhang, granted, his UFC debut was against Surreal Asker back in 2017. Um that was at heavyweight, and he lost that fight via round two where he nigga choke, and then lost to Rashad Coulter, which is 205 pounds, and Coulter missed weight in that fight, so essentially had two heavyweight fights, um, and that last fight was back in 2018. Prior to that was 3-0 and at heavyweight in the Chinese Super Fight, um, Chinese Super Fight Series, or some promotion out of China that doesn't produce a lot of good talent. I've been very critical of Chinese fighters this year, and... They just haven't been performing very well. Even their queen, 
uh, Zhang Wei Li. They just haven't really been performing well. Um, there's something going on over that performance institute, in my opinion. I think they're just, I think they're progressing fighters way too quick. And I mean, here's an example right here: Hu Yao Zhang, three and zero, fighting an obscure, obscure organization in China, gets picked up at the UFC PI, and all of a sudden he's fighting in the UFC. They're pushing those fighters way too quickly. There's a reason why organizations in in uh, China, Kunlun Fighting Championships. Um, there's a handful of them. I can't name um, na can't name them off the top of my head. Uh, road fighting championships over there in Korea as well. There's a lot of great organizations over there in China that uh, the UFC could put those fighters through, but they just choose not to because they want to push them and promote them, and they're just not succeeding in the UFC. I don't know what to say. Uh, the odds in this fight were relatively close, considering the uh, nonsense this fight really is. Um, yeah, the topology picks are not close on this one either 93 percent for petrosky and for a pretty gosh darn good reason topology community by the way only 1700 votes usually on a card like this they'd have more like 3000 so maybe this card isn't going to deliver or at least it's not getting the proper attention it deserves for sure i don't know why um I don't know why, but there you go. 93% for Petrosky for a darn good reason. I don't know why Hu Yo Zhang is in the UFC. Uh, that's just simply because the UFC puts these Chinese fighters in way too early in their career. To be fair, I mean, I was saying the same thing about Surreal Gaon. Surreal Gaon was 3-0 in his UFC, in his UFC uh, when he went into his UFC debut, and that was in a kind of a small promotion over there in, uh, was it in, no, that was in French Canada. Um, that was in Quebec. I can't remember the organization off the top of my head, which lately they've been producing some great talent, to be quite honest with you. We have one French fighter coming on this card, um, fighting in a good organization over there in the motherland over there, actually in France. So, uh, by the way, uh, Hu Yao Zhang is 0% takedown defense rate going into this fight. Granted, that was against Surreal Asker. He was taken down four times and that was at heavyweight. Petrosky's got this fight. Uh, this is one of my more confident picks. Uh, the odds are relatively narrow considering this entire card. So that's a pretty safe bet, honestly. There are not a lot of safe bets on this card, even though there seems to be a lot of locks, aside from Islam Makachev. Uh, but even with the odds that they're giving Makachev, um, the odds makers are going to make a lot of money because I think a lot of stupid people are putting a lot of money on Dan Hooker. And I don't really know why because people love Dan Hooker. And Hooker's really won a lot of freaking fans recently. I mean, geez. Uh, since that knockout from against Michael Chandler, and he almost retired after that because of how terrible that was and then how he handled that loss. Uh, we all really got to know Dan Hooker really well over the last several months. And then the uh, Dustin Poirier fight was a... F I don't know how that went, didn't win fight of the year. That was one of the best fights I've ever seen in my life. Certainly, I believe it was round three. But we will cross that bridge when we get to it. We have another intriguing fight at 145. Just an intriguing stylistic matchup between Makwan Americani and Lerone Murphy. This fight taking place at Featherweight. And Makwan Americani, he's from Finland, or actually he's from Iran. Grew up in Finland. Mr. Finland, uh, Makwan Americani, 16-6 and six in his MMA career with one knockout. The iconic eight-second knockout in his UFC debut, that flying knee. 11 submission wins and four decision victories after that. Are in his entire MMA career, he stands at five foot ten, seventy two inch reach on paper. Um, this fight's kind of even, or I should say, um, in the height and reach department. Lerone Murphy from the United Kingdom. He's got a record of ten wins with zero losses and one draw, with six knockouts and four decision victories. Lerone Murphy is a massive favorite in this one, minus three forty favorite for Lerone Murphy. Makwan Americani plus two sixty. Uh, Lerone Murphy is two zero and one in his UFC career. Uh, he had a split draw against Zabiro Tuhugov. Uh, September 2019, Tuhugov is also on this card. He defeated Hikado Hamos via round one TKO after that, and then de defeated Douglas Silva de Andrade via unanimous decision in June of this year. He was the full contact contender, a featherweight champion. That's a small organization out of England. Was 8-0 prior to his UFC career, and I'm going to pull up that opponent record, by the way. His opponent's combined record prior to his UFC debut, 45-73 which says a lot about the Russian organizations and a lot of organizations over in the UK, uh, aside from Cage Warriors. Cage Warriors is great. I think it's a little overrated, but it still is really good. Just because it's overrated doesn't mean it's not good. Um, for Tuhugov, in that fight, uh, he outstruck him 28-22 to in the significant strike department. 65-28 to was controlled 9 minutes and 29 seconds. 
it was uh, he was actually dropped an overhand left. Uh, kind of an awkward overhand left, but he recovered quickly in that one. Uh, was controlled a lot in that fight, but he was 0 for 6 on takedown, or he was taken down six times in that fight, was knocked down once, was just a weird, awkward overhand left, but for the most part, did really good on the feet, made it a brawl, and um, Tuhugov did enough to ended up, ended up making that fight a draw. Uh, and a very, very impressive UFC debut. Even though it was a draw, we definitely learned that Lerone Murphy, you know, I, I heavily criticize fighters for what kind of promotions they came out of. And I always say it, just because you fought cans doesn't mean you're a can crush. Or it doesn't mean you're a can crush. But it doesn't mean you're not good, okay? Um, we saw that most recently. Ah, that was last weekend in the opening bout. What was that? The former LFA Bantamweight champion. I'm blanking on his name right now, but he ended up having a pretty solid performance. Fell short, but still had a pretty good performance. Um, and he's had a great career, knocking out Hikato Hamos. Uh, stood over the guard, got the takedown, and um, got a big knockout from ground and pound, as a matter of fact. Uh, in his last fight against Douglas Silva, Dan Drage, two judges had a 29-28. One judge had a 30-27. He outstruck him 48-39. to He was able to keep the fight standing for the most part, winning to a unanimous decision victory there. So, really, it's going to become if Lauren Murphy can keep the fight standing. Because Maquan Americani, if you guys didn't know, he had only trained for a couple of months in MMA. He came in... Uh, before his UFC debut, that is. In his entire MMA career, he just relied solely on his wrestling skills. Didn't really train MMA. I mean, that's some old school stuff that you don't see very often. And in his UFC debut, after just a couple of months of training, was this big superstar, Mr. Finland. Came out flying, need him. Nailed the post-fight interview, man. Everybody loved this guy. He was just a charming, good-looking guy with a flashy knockout. Then he won his next fight via, uh, via round one, rear naked choke, defeated Mike Wilkinson after that via unanimous decision, lost to Arnold Allen via split decision, defeated Jason Knight via split decision, defeated Chris Fishgold via Anaconda choke, lost to Shane Burgos via round three knockout, which is arguably the more similar fighter to Lerone Murphy. He got pretty exhausted in round number three in that one. Burgos is able to keep the fight standing, which will make this fight kind of interesting to see how Americani might be able to react to that. He's submitted Danny Henry via round one Anaconda choke, lost to Edson Barboza via unanimous decision, and lost his last fight to Camula, Camula Kirk via unanimous decision. He's got 11 submission victories in his MMA career. Three Minica chokes, a triangle, a heel hook, a leg lock, a guillotine, and four anaconda, Anacondas. Loves the arm in submissions. Uh, he was the 2010 Finnish National 66 Kilo Freestyle Wrestling Runner-Up Champion. Uh, took third place in 2013. 2012 Mr. Finland Runner-Up. Uh, so I guess he wasn't quite Mr. Finland. His stats going into this fight, he has probably the lowest strikes landed rate I've ever seen out of a fighter. 1.4 significant strikes landed per 15 or per minute, that is. But 3.61 takedowns landed per 15 minutes at a 40% accuracy rate. Is more than welcome to get taken down as well. 57% takedown defense rate. 1.1 submission average. He's got 25 takedowns. He's got one takedown in every fight except for the eight-second fight in his UFC debut against Andy Ogle, which lasted eight seconds. He didn't need to go for a takedown on that one, but he's landed a takedown in every single one of his fights. Um, so this fight might be one of the more shocking picks here. I'm going with Americani in this one. Uh, Americani... Even though Lerone Murphy fought Sabir Tuhugov, which arguably could be a better wrestler, and he was able to deal with that a little bit more, uh, better than I think um, he, he was able to deal with that. I'm assuming he's going to deal with it better against Makwan Americani, which makes this an intriguing fight. I mean, Lerone Murphy should win this fight, to be quite honest with you, but Makwan Americani, he's a specialist. He's going to go to the ground. We saw in that Lerone Murphy fight against Sabir Tuhugov, Tuhugov kind of panicked a little bit after getting cracked on the feet, and he was panic wrestling for the vast majority of the time. Makwan Americani is a little bit more seasoned, in my opinion, on the ground in freestyle wrestling than Sabir Tuhugov, which could make this fight interesting. And Lauren Murphy, he needs to have a response to it. And for Americani as well, it really depends on his gas tank as well. Can his gas tank hold up? What happens if he doesn't get a takedown repeatedly? By the way, Lauren Murphy, again, his stats are kind of swayed after that Zabir Tuhugov fight, but only 41% takedown defense rate. And Tuhugov kind of let that fight slip between his fingers as well. If he had been a little bit more active on the ground, perhaps he could have won. Uh, and Lauren Murphy really needs to be careful as well with a lot of his uh, submissions. Or a lot, or Lauren Murphy needs to be careful if he does get taken down to not give anything up. 
So I like this fight. This might be a uh, big underdog pick. He's uh, Makwan American. He's plus 260 underdog. Lerone Murphy minus 340 favorite. Um, there are a lot of hype trains on this card. Lerone Murphy is definitely one of them. And the odds makers, they've been a little bit weird tonight for sure. Let's see what the tapology community has to say. I think it's swayed heavily in favor of uh, of uh, Lerone Murphy as well. Yeah, swayed heavily in favor of Lerone Murphy. A lot of people, very, very unlikely for a knockout. 8% the, of the 13%, so that's probably just a handful of people that picked Americani via knockout, which I think that's extremely unlikely. Perhaps a submission. I'm going with a decision victory, to be quite honest with you guys. Um, again, this is kind of a wild card pick as well, but I'm going for the throat, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going for perfect tonight. I'm not going for the safe bets. I am doing. I am playing it safe with a lot of decisions. As you can tell, I do think there will be a lot of decisions on this card. And if Americani is going to win this fight, he cannot get gassed out. The first round is going to be really interesting. If Maquan Americani can get the fight down repeatedly um, and, and bully Lerone Murphy, that's the odds will greatly go in favor of Americani, of, of Americani. And if he does get the fight down to the mat, can he sustain that type of output um, in the latter rounds as well? So an interesting fight. Lauren Murphy is still a stud. Um, I'm not discrediting Lauren Murphy. I do think, however, that this is uh, a tough stylistic matchup. And if you can get past this stylistic matchup, there are not a whole lot of other wrestlers at 145. So he's going to be a very interesting prospect if he's able to get past America. Even if he loses to Mako and Americani, again, Makwan Americani is kind of a specialist at this point. I think we can all agree on that. And there's no other fighter really like him at 145 right now. So he's kind of a one and done. And Lerone Murphy really fought probably after this fight will have fought two of maybe the more solid wrestlers at 145 pounds in Dehugov and uh, Makwan Americani. So I like this fight a lot. I do think it's a tough stylistic matchup, so we'll see how Lauren Murphy is able to handle that. A lot of people handle that. A lot of people think he will be able to handle it extremely well. I beg to differ. This fight is a lot closer than the odds makers and the topology community has it out to be. So perhaps this is a little bit of a hipster pick on my part, but I'm going with Americani in this one. And if I'm right, this would be the biggest underdog that I've been able to correctly pick. I've picked the last. Big wild card underdog that I picked was Alex Caceres last week, but that ended up working out well for me. But I also picked um, Roxanne Modafferi, and that went horribly. So even though I can make a solid argument for Makwan Americani, I could very well just as easily see L Lerone Murphy. Um, I keep saying Lauren Murphy. Lerone Murphy. If I keep saying Lerone Murphy, uh, I'm sorry. Americon. What do you guys think? Won't stop his shot. Yusuf, even if he lands, Islam's just going to eat it. Uh, Mr. Finland, yep, he's fast and slick. I agree. Some people just ain't made to be hit, lol. Won't KO him. Yeah, so I like Americani in this fight. He's definitely one of the more wild card picks. If you guys are betting on this and love to bet underdogs, there's some money to be made on this card. Very rarely do you ever see favorites like this on this um, in the UFC. And it's not even like they're protecting anybody. The UFC, when you, whenever you see a massive favorite, either they're really freaking good, and in the case of Islam Makhachev, he's minus 650. There's a solid good reason why he's minus 650. Um, they don't really make fights like that too often. How Or they are protecting a fighter, like Sean O'Malley against Chris Matino. That's, that's although rare, it doesn't happen very often. And you can obviously point to certain situations but that's very unusual. 99% of UFC fights are very, very well made. And this is one of them. This is a very, very good fight. Even though the odds are swayed heavily in favor of Lauren Murphy, that's more of a testament to Lauren Murphy than it is um, uh, the UFC matchmaking. So I like this fight a lot. Props to the matchmakers. All right, the next fight on the card is yet again, perhaps, a, I don't know, if the odds are relatively even on this one, probably the most even fight on this card. Shamil Gatsmadov taking on Michael Oleksichuk. Alex, Alexi Chuk, this the first Polish fighter to be fighting on this card. He's 15 and four with 10 knockouts, one submission, four decision victories. This fight takes place at light heavyweight. Uh, he's got 10 knockout wins, one submission win, four decision victories. Relatively small for the weight class. He's six foot flat and has a 74 inch reach. Alexi Chuk is a plus 125 underdog. I mean, when you consider these Dagestanis, they were all heavy underdogs except for Gatsmadov. Dagestan, Russia, 14-0. Five wins by knockout, five wins by submission, four wins by decision. Alexa Chuk, 
Um, surrenders two inches in height and two inches in reach. Got some odd He's 1-0 in his UFC debut. Defeated Klitson or Bray Uvi, a split decision in November 2019 at the uh, Zabit versus Calvin Cater fight back uh, that fight took place at 205 pounds as well back in 2019. So uh, he went 2-0 in the PFL, won both fights, but was forced out of the bout for the championship um, back in 2018. So he was replaced in the tournament. Uh, went 1-0 in ACB, 1-0 in World Series of Fighting. Six first-round finishes. Master of, National Master of Sport and Combat Sambo. Brown belt Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with five submission wins, three arm bars, a guillotine, and a triangle choke. Won the World Amateur MMA Union uh, European Championships and the World Championships as a as an amateur. And I speak very, very highly of if you have an amateur career that's very highly touted like that where you're the best in the world at the amateur level, uh, that really speaks volumes. And you're coming into your professional career with – Full head of steam, to say the least. Uh, he's had four canceled bouts over the last several, um, over the last couple of years. Uh, three of them, um, over over in St. Prue back in April of 2021, uh, couldn't. That was one of those COVID events that got uh, canceled. He was supposed to fight Oven St. Prue again in August, but he was forced to withdraw. Was supposed to face Devin Clark, and then April of this year. Well, was also supposed to fight again, but had visa issues, which forced him out in April of this year. And his fight against Clinton Abreu, he was able to outstrike him 64 to 32 in the Cinevia Strike Department, 82 to 47. Was taken down once, however. Um, only had 10 head strikes. A lot of it was down low. I actually had uh, Clinton Abreu win in that fight. It wasn't that impressive of a performance, to be quite honest with you. Tested the waters on the feet. In fact, he was taken down once in that fight. Didn't land a single takedown. Hasn't finished a fight since January 2016. Three-time Abu Dhabi tournament winner. World Grappling Association. World champion at 92 kilos. This was as a brown belt. So he's very credentialed on the ground. He's got five submissions, like I said. Three arm bars, a guillotine, and a triangle choke. Uh, let's take a look at his career outside of the UFC. I'm kind of curious because I didn't make any notes of that. But yeah, needless to say, his uh, debut in the UFC wasn't all that impressive. A ACB 51 uh, back 2017. So inactivity has definitely plagued him. In fact, he took a year off from this PFL fight to his UFC debut. But that's a common trend. Uh, even though he didn't look that great in his UFC debut, uh, it's not something that you can knock at all. Had a lot of first round finishes. Just looking at his topology career. His opponent's combined record was not that great uh, outside of the, outside of uh, his couple fights. Well, I get lots of 0-0 fighters, 0 0-0, 0-0, 0-0, 1-1, 0-0, 0-0, 6-3, 1-1, 10-19. And then it wasn't until he got to World Series of Fighting where he started to fight good competition. So uh, he got a lot of finishes against a lot of sub-level competition. Defeated Teddy Holder via round 2 TKO. And World Series of Fighting, he had a professional record 9-2 going in that fight. Defeated Rodney Wallace, 26-12. PFL, defeated Eddie Gordon, UFC veteran there. Defeated Rex Harris, uh, who was 11-3. And then defeated Clinton Abreu uh, in his UFC debut. And again, not that great of a performance. He only landed a whopping 10 head strikes in that fight. A lot of the strikes were to the leg and to the body. Oleskuchuk, on the other hand, is known for his stand-up ability, very much so. 3-2 with one no contest in his UFC career. Uh, had a no contest against Khalil Roundtree. It was originally a win, but Clomiphene overturned it to a no contest. Suffered a little bit of a suspension there. Came back in February of 2019, knocking out Jean Vellante via run one TKO. Uh, defeated Ghazi Murad and Tigulev in just 44 seconds. Won that fight via knockout. Lost to Ovin St. Peru via Von Fluchoke. Lost to Jimmy Crute via round one Kimura. Defeated Moustakis Buskakis in his last fight at UFC 260. Won that fight via split decision. That was March of this year. So, within the, in the Bukaskis fight, uh, it was kind of a close decision. Both met, um, both me and Tibro ha actually had it for Bukaskis as well. My brother was here for that fight. Both of us had it for Bukaskis. Didn't couldn't quite agree on that decision there, but they gave it to Alexa Chuck. Uh, Alexa Chuck was outstruck in that fight, fifty-eight to fifty-six, and the significant strike department actually outstruck him, seventy-seven to sixty-two. Landed twenty-six body body uh, strikes. It was a very fun fight. But his stock didn't go up that much. 
uh, lands 4.45 significant strikes per minute, absorbs 3.24, 52% significant strike accuracy rate, 67% takedown defense rate. I think God, God Smadov was going to try to take this fight down to the mat and submit him right out of the gate. And we're talking about a guy here in Alexa Chuck. That got Von Flued by Oban St. Preux. When you get Von Flued by Oban St. Preux, I get it. It's common. But you deliberately put yourself in a Von Flew. Like I said, don't go for guillotines from bottom side control. Especially against Oban St. Preux. Like, not a lot of fighters know the Von Flew choke. Okay? It's it's readily available at all times if a fighter deliberately... You have to deliberately put yourself into it. And he did. Gosh darn it. Got right dull by Jimmy Crute. I think the same thing's going to happen in this fight against Gatsmanov. He's not a bad fighter. Um... Uh, he's a th Thunderstruck fight late 205 pound champion, defended that title two times. He had a one year suspension by Usad for Clomaphene. He's got three submission losses, which is what Gatsmadov is best at. So, what do you guys expect from this one? Uh, Lex Chuck, he's very good on the feet. Very, uh, he's, like I said, he's very small for the weight class, very fast. So, unless he catches Gatsmadov, and if Gatsmadov can't get the fight down to the mat, make it an intriguing fight. However,. What, what am I missing in the comments, by the way? LTD9329 says, came for some MMA commentary, but instead you're witnessing a philosophical discussion of advanced proportions in the comments. That is just great to hear. Like I said, I have the most, um, yeah, it's basically just a bunch of mini farts, make up one giant fart. What the, f what the hell? Sounds like someone might be getting blocked here and there's a second by me, but anyway, man, oh gosh. All are crazy, man. I was about to say, like, yeah, I have the most intelligent fans out there, but one fella is kind of ruining that vibes for me. Um, in the fight against Tegelov, um, left uppercut on the back foot, sent him down. He's got very good hands moving forward, moving backward. However, if he can't keep the fight standing, he's going to get tapped out and submitted. So I'm going via round one submission for Gatsmadov. We're talking about an Abu Dhabi, three-time Abu, Abu Dhabi tournament winner as a brown belt, World Grappling Association champion at 92 kilos. Flux Chuck keeps going for guillotines from bottom side control and getting Von Flued by Ovin St. Pru. He's not going to stand a chance in this fight against Shamil, Adir, or Sh Shamil Gatsmadov, so I think I made my point on that one there. All right, one of the more intriguing fights on the card as well. This fight taking place at 170 pounds. Benoit St. Denis taking on, in his UFC debut, taking on a very experienced veteran in Eliza Zaleski de Santos. Uh, Benoit St. Denis, he's from France, 8 0 professional record with one knockout, seven submissions, zero decision victories. He stands at 5 foot 11, unknown reach. Is a plus 155 underdog for, Alex, uh, for Eliza Zaleski de Santos from Brazil, 22 and 7, 14 wins by knockout, three by submission, and, excuse me, five decision victories. He's a minus 185 favorite. Which, when the odds makers have it that close for a guy making his UFC debut, that didn't really come from that big of a promotion. Taking on a guy who's 8-3 and three in the UFC and was just on a killer winning streak. That speaks volumes about a fight about that fighter. You know, uh, you, you have to be a stud. You have to be an absolute stud for the odds to be that close. And what's what does the topology community say about this fight? Because I, I think it should heavily be in favor of Eliza Celestia de Santos. Because I I'll be honest with you. No, it's 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 relatively close. Zaleski, 63% of the Tap House community picking Zaleski. St. Denis, 37%. The vast majority of those by submission. Handful by knockout, a couple by decision. I don't know why anybody would pick St. Denis by knockout in this fight unless Zaleski did something stupid. Um man. There are a lot. I love the Tapology community to death. That's not my community, by the way, so I, I'm gonna crap on them a little bit here, okay? Not the best picks, okay, for some of these guys here. All right, I'm not saying this is a lot. Benoit uh, Saint Denis fought out a good promotion, five and zero in Brave Combat Federation. His last two fights were at a 165 pound catchweight catchweight fight, so he's relatively. Um, you've been challenged. Oh, I guess I've been challenged. The Lord's servant. Anyway, sorry, I don't know who that was. Um, He's fought in March and August. He's already fought twice this year. Five and zero in Brave Combat Federation with seven submission victories. Um, he had one no contest due to a doctor stoppage. His seven submissions, two of them via guillotine, rear naked choke, arm bar, knee bar, two triangles, seven submissions in total. Has a background in Brazilian jiu jitsu. Actually started his martial arts career as uh, judoka. Transitioned over to jiu jitsu. 
started to pick up Muay Thai. He was actually with the French Special Forces, I guess. That's that's the only thing. He just said French Special Forces. I'm not sure if it's French Foreign Legion or what have you. I haven't worked with French very much. But I'll tell you what, if it's French, what I think it is, it's pretty pretty big freaking deal right there, okay? We're talking about a different type of person. And that says a lot. Like, you have to understand where I where I live and who I work with here, okay? That says a lot. If, it's, if he worked with who I think he did, that speaks volumes to the kind of person he is. Um, his opponent's combined record going in this fight, 94 and 50, averaging 12 and 6. Uh, trains part-time at Bulgarian talk team, but trains mostly out of France. Uh, good body kicks. He's got solid Muay Thai, to be quite honest with you. And he, his takedowns, he's takedown heavy for sure, which makes him very unique. Um, doesn't have traditional anything. Traditional ending, anything in takedowns. He, he kind of just grabs a hold of you and just tries to get you down to the mat. There's no blast doubles. There's no hip tosses. Like, again, he's got a judoka background, but he's going to try to grab a hold of you and put you down to the mat. That's the best way I can describe it, okay? I wish I could get down in the technique of it, but he might do some duck unders and climb up your back, try to take your back, try to just take a leg out from underneath you, but basically, you're standing. I want you like this on the ground, okay? That's basically what he does, okay? There's no other way to describe it. Um, Eliza Zaleski de Santos, he's 8-3 and three in his UFC career. Uh, lost to Nicholas Dalby via split decision in May 2015. Defeated Omari Akhmedov via round 3 TKO. Lost to... Or and defeated Katia Nakamura, defeated Lyman Good, Max Griffin, Sean Strickland via round one knockout, Luigi Vendramini via round two TKO, Curtis Milliner Lee Jing, or lost to Lee Jing Liang um, via round three TKO in August 2019, defeated Alexi Koncheko via an end decision in March 2020, lost his last fight to Muslim Salikov via split decision in July of 2020. He was a former jungle fight, 170 pound champion. That's a very good promotion out of Brazil. With one defense of that title. Three fight of the night bonuses. A black belt Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I didn't even message you. Move a lot. But anyway, sorry. Um, his fight against Akhmedov. Um, when was that fight? Uh, yeah, he had some great knees to the Muay Thai clinch. Ended up getting a standing TKO as a matter of fact. And the Curtis Milliner finish got... Got a takedown, got the back, ground and pound, and then eventually he sunk in a rear naked choke. Sean Strickland, he had a beautiful spinning hook kick straight to the tone that set him down and some follow-up strikes. I can't express to you guys enough how difficult it is to land a spinning hook kick. It's probably one of the most difficult kicks to land. And a couple of hammer fists put Sean Strickland completely to sleep. In the Avenger Meanie fight, he hit him with a flying knee and then a right hook after that sent him to unconsciousness. Uh, he's got a 52% takedown defense rate in this fight, which could make it a little bit interesting with the takedown heavy game of Benoit St. Denis. But, uh, he's, like I say, he's a black belt with Jiu Jitsu. I, I think that even the, the Dos Santos in this one, I think he might even have a grappling advantage. Just I'm not talking about wrestling advantage. I think that's in favor of St. Denis. But, I mean, let's get a Santos. He's a, just, a few, just a few months ago, like two years ago, he was on his seven-fight win streak, man. So I, I can't imagine a guy like Benoit St. Denis having much success. Stylistically, it might be a good fight for him. But that's about it. Um, Lezowski de Santos needs to keep this fight standing for sure. I think he has a significant uh, striking advantage. Ben, Benoit St. Denis does have good striking. I was impressed. That, then again, he wasn't facing like that great a competition uh, outside of the UFC. But some, some good solid records out of there, uh, out of that promotion. But just based on some of his fights... I just don't see what the what the fuss is about, to be quite honest with you guys. I, I just don't see it. I, I could be wrong, man. You know, he, he's cutting through some of these fighters against, I mean, some good records, I guess. But Brave Combat Federation, that's a good promotion, too. Can't name too many. And he, he's done good against those fighters. I'm not sure if he's going to do that against a guy like Eliza Zaleski de Santos. The odds are relatively close for this one. Uh, Dos Santos, very moderate favorite, minus 185. The topology community is very split on this one. Um, very unlikely St. Denis gets a knockout in this one, or at least a TKO win. Even more unlikely for a submission, or maybe not more likely. Uh, maybe not more, more unlikely, that is. But uh, St. Denis is going to win this fight. I don't think he's going to submit uh, Dos Santos, so you might need to try to grind out a decision victory in this one. 
But for Zaleski Dos Santos, I'm picking him via TKO. I think he's got a significant striking advantage on the feet. And probably one of the later rounds. Uh, round three knockout for Eliza Zaleski Dos Santos is what I'm going with. All right, the next fight on the card. Move it up to 185. Albert Duraev taking on uh, Roman or Albert Duraev taking on Roman Kopulov. This is a good fight, my friends. I'm very, very high on Duraev. He won his his neck and tender series bout in just dominant fashion. Ended up winning it via rear naked choke. Says he wants to fight every month. That was back in September. It's October now, so. He's 32 years old. Dana wants him to fight every month, and he wants to fight every month. Was out for a little bit of time. He made his UFC, he made his MMA debut, that is, back in September 2011. By the way, I mean, Duraev, Dur let's let's go pound for pound for these guys. Duraev from Volgrad, Russia. Um, uh, it's about 200 miles east from the Ukrainian border, about 600 miles south from uh, Moscow. Just think that region, not in the Caucasus region, which has... Lots of fighters coming out of that region of Chechnya and Dagestan. But Duraev from Volgrad, Russia, 14 and 3, three knockouts, nine submissions, two decision victories. Roman Kopulov from Novobrinsk, Russia, which is basically in Siberia, 8 and 1. I've learned a lot about my Russian geography, so I'm about to show that off and polish it off a little bit. Uh, he's 8 and 1 in his MMA career with seven knockouts, one decision victory. Kopulov is plus 210 underdog, Duraev minus 275, and I think it should be more for Duraev, to be quite honest with you. And I, I really wonder, the Tapology community, I, if I remember correctly, is not split on that one at all either. But anyway, Kopulov, he lost to Carl Robertson via round three, Rear Naked Choke in his UFC debut. That was, yeah, no kidding. Okay. Tapology community paints a good picture here. Duraev, dominant fashion, 67 of the 93% by submission. Uh, that's the vast majority. I think I have, yeah, got some out via round one submission. Kopulov didn't really impress me much in his UFC debut. Granted, he did take on Carl Robertson, which is, is impressive, but wasn't that great. He lost that fight via round three where he naked choke. He's had a couple of canceled bouts prior to, or uh, ever since his UFC debut, three of them in total. Went 3-0 in Fight Nights Global, went 1-0 in ACB. He's fought some good competition. It's actually looked really good. He was 8-0 prior to his UFC career. Was the Fight Nights Global 185-pound champion. This is Kopulov I'm talking about here, by the way. Uh, and defended the title once. Was the WCSA 185-pound champion. Went 1-0 at 205 pounds. 1-0 at a 190-pound catchweight belt. Has two finishes in round number four as well. But in the Robertson fight, he ate a whopping 26 leg kicks. Uh, kept them from really porting it on. Was taken down late in the fight up against the cage. Was held down. Eventually had his back taken and... Got choked out in that fight. Uh, however, he, despite his, he's new to the UFC. He hasn't fought in over two years now, or darn near three years. Uh, that his last fight was November 2019. He's very experienced and very intelligent. That's what we've seen. He's gone five rounds many times throughout his career. Very experienced, knows how to pace himself. Um, However, I think he's just taking on a better guy, better, better fighter than in Albert Duraev. Duraev making his UFC debut, dominated on Dan White's like a tender series, 32 years old, 7-0 in ACB, nine submissions, two arm bars, two triangles, four winning chokes, a north-south choke. Um, in the fight, he only really landed two significant strikes. However, landed 78 total strikes, got him down, pop, 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 lots of this in your face, 22 uh 22 shots landed per minute he was averaging. Landed 78 total strikes in like a three-minute fight. <laughs> uh, drive way overqualified for the two's night contender series. And my theory is, you know, the contender series contract is a little bit lower than the initial contract. But whatever. Probably money thing. This guy's going to be fighting a lot. And he's going to be one of the dark horses at 185. And, you know, 185, they don't have any wrestlers. I'm telling you right now, they got Derek Brunson. That's it. Albert Duraev is going to shake up the division, in my opinion. Kopulov, he's a good fighter. This is a bad fight for him. I do like Kopulov. Wasn't too impressed with him in his UFC debut. And that was a long time ago. Everything beyond his UFC debut looks sensational. He's supposed to be kind of a world beater. That's why they gave him to Carl Robertson right out of the gate. But if somehow Kopulov can get past Duraev and derail this, I'm not even going to call it a hype train. 
But I'm I'm on the hype train. Uh, maybe I'm I'm the conductor of the hype train here. Okay, there's not a whole lot of people hyping up Darayev as much as me, but I'm the conductor of the hype train for Albert Darayev. I, I really think he's gonna shake up the 185 pound division. Think about how well blonde haired Derek Brunson is doing right now. If this guy can avoid big shots standing this guy's going to shake up the division in my opinion in a division that desperately needs wrestlers they just need someone to shake up the division just a little bit offer new faces okay right now we got striker upon striker upon striker upon striker and then Derek brunson who's not even like that elite of a wrestler to be quite honest with you but it's just a game that he's been playing and has been working pretty well for him so drive desperately needed at 185 right now in my opinion I like I like that line by the way, right? I'm the conductor of the hype train. You know, this is my this is my new guy, okay? You know, I was the conductor of the hype train for Murad Nabalashvili since 2018, okay? But now he's actually killing it. This is my new hipster guy, and it's the wrestler. Obviously, I'm biased towards wrestlers. Y'all know that, especially on this card, man. Um, I pretty much went safe across the board for wrestlers, except for Yam or except for Glover Teixeira. I think you can call him a wrestler in this fight against uh, against Jan Blahovich. He better bring his wrestling shoes at least because I don't think he's going to be able to stand with Blahovich. But we'll get to that. By the way, if you guys haven't seen my total breakdown for uh, the main event and co-main event, watch that. I will go way into depth. I'll just be – and I go way more into depth on the different possibilities for Glover Teixeira and Jan Blahovich and Piotr Jan and Corey Sanhagen. I'm pretty much going to go the route that I think is most likely and the route that I'm picking, except for the Sanhagen fight. I compromised a little bit here, okay? All right. In the 145-pound division, Hikado Hamos taking on Zabira Tuhugov. Hikado Hamos, 15-3 uh, in his MMA career with three knockouts, seven submissions, and five decision victories. Zabira Tuhugov from Chechnya, Russia, 19-5 with seven knockouts, one submission, and 11 decision victories. Tuhugov, minus 170 favorite. Hikado Hamos, plus 150 underdog. Tuhugov, 4-2-1 in his UFC career. Uh, defeated Douglas Silva, Dan Draj via unanimous decision back in 2014. Defeated Ernest Chavez via round one TKO. Defeated Felipe Nova via split decision. Lost to Nato Moicano via split decision back in 2016. Then returned. Has gotten 1-1-1 one, one, and one since his return. He had a draw against Lerone Murphy. We saw him earlier on this card at UFC 242. Defeated Kevin Aguilar via round one TKO. And lost to Amin Hakim to Wadu. September 2020. Me and Hakeem is a ferocious fighter. Uh, he missed weight for that fight. Weighed 150 pounds. So, Zabir Tuhugov will be focusing on his weight tomorrow morning. Uh, probably, like, tonight, as a matter of fact, because they're in Abu Dhabi. So, we'll keep an eye on that. First time I've gotten to call a fight since UFC 242, as a matter of fact. The fight that's been in Abu Dhabi. I've missed all of Fight Island. Thank you, Deployment, for that one. But missed, I missed all of Fight Island. And I was the first one to call... Uh, I was the first one to call where Fight Island was. I said Abu Dhabi. I said it was in Abu Dhabi. To be fair, I didn't think it was going to be Yaz Island because I didn't know Yaz Island existed. I knew it was, it's a river, okay? It's, it's a man-made river. I didn't know you can call that an island, but th I guess it is an island, I guess, but whatever. Um, to Hugov. And his fight against Hakmin Hakim Dawadu, um, he kept the fight standing. Uh, to Hugov was on the back foot in round number three, survived, lost a split decision, um, yeah, it was just unable to take the fight down to the mat. And Hakeem Dewadi was very freaking good on the feet, man. Let me tell you. Probably some of the best striking. So even though he lost a striking battle, mostly striking battle against me and Hakeem Dewadi, um, he was one for seven on his takedowns in that fight. He was outstruck 69 to 35, 70 to 40 in the total strike department. Was 15 3 prior to his UFC debut. Um, 11 3 at 155, 3 0 at actually above 155. He's got a total of 5 2 and 1 at 145 pounds. Um, like I said, he's coming off a loss against Hakeem Duwadu in a fight that he just couldn't take down to the mat. And if you can't take the fight down to the mat and you're forced to face Hakeem Duwadu in a striking battle, nine times out of 10. Nine out of ten fighters on the roster at 145 are going to lose that battle, even in the top 15, okay? Me and Hakeem, very, very, very good on the feet. So I don't hold that loss too much over his head. However, it is a little concerning. He's not this uh, wrecking ball that's going to be able to take everybody down at 145. Or maybe it's just a pebble in the shoe. Uh, maybe he just stumbling, stumbles a little bit. Um, was suspended for two years for Austrian back in 2016. After that two-year suspension was nearly up, attacked McGregor during that whole 
uh, UFC 229 incident. Uh, suspended for one year. However, it was reduced down to 35 days to get him on to UFC 242. I thought that was kind of a pathetic move by the UFC and by the athletic commissions to allow that to happen. But they cut it just a little short. So he wasn't going to fight anyway. So whatever. They got him on the card that they wanted him to be on. So I thought that was really funny. But was forced to pay twenty five grand for that incident. They were not messing around, okay? The athletic commission for that incident, they fined Habib, I think, 500000 Okay, that's the biggest fine that I've ever seen for a fighter. Um, he was the master of sport and combat sambo, master of sport and hand-to-hand combat. In his UFC career, he's landed 2.54 sniffing strikes per minute, absorbs 2.53. 2.54 takedowns landed per 15 minutes. Um, in his fight against Kevin Aguilar, was able to drop him with two big left hooks and eventually led to a ground-and-pound TKO. Uh, 100% takedown defense rate for Tehugov. I don't think Hikado Hamos is going to try to take the fight down anytime soon. Uh, but for Hikado Hamos, very experienced as well. 6-2 and two in his UFC career. Defeated Michinori Tanaka via unanimous decision. Back in February 2017, defeated Amy and Zahabi in one of the biggest highlight reel spinning elbows you'll ever see since Yuri Bohatska almost topped it. You know, I'm mean, gonna. I, I don't know. They were both very similar, to say the least. The thing is, the Amy and Zahabi fight, that was back at USA 217. Just an iconic night in general, but he missed with a spinning back elbow shortly before and then landed it on the second attempt. Defeated Dwight Hung Kang. Um, defeated Kwai Hung Kang via split decision. Lost to Saeed Nurmagomedov uh, via round one spin kick to kill. Defeated Journey Newsom via unanimous decision and then moved down to 145. Um, and then defeated Luis... Eduardo Garrett Gordy via round one rear naked choke. Lost to Lauren Murphy via round one TKO. Defeated Bill Algio via unanimous decision. He's a black belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's got seven submissions, three triangles, an armbar, three rear naked chokes. He was the EFC Brazil 155 pound championship. Uh, lost a shot at the Legacy Fighting Championships prior to his UFC debut. Uh, that's the Legacy FC in Brazil, by the way, not the, the Legacy FC. Um, two and one since his return down to 145 and his fight against Garrett Gordy. He went for a bad knee, ducked under. Um, oh, pardon me. Went for a knee tap takedown, hit a nice duck under. That's one of those common moves that you see from Hikado Hamos. He'll kind of charge in, kind of, kind of trying to pick your knee and then end up popping out on the other side, hitting a beautiful duck under, then rides the back. Um, after he's riding the back, he actually picked him up, suplexed him, get Tripped the legs out from underneath them, dropped them down to the mat, and ended up uh, sinking in both hooks and sinking in a rear naked choke. So look out for that move. He likes to kind of, ah, shoot, I totally kicked the crap out of my toe there. Um, likes to fake down low, come up underneath like he's going for a knee tap takedown. Duck underneath, ride the back, and try to trip you out from underneath there. That's one of his common moves. He went for it multiple times, got it in the Gary Gordy fight. Um, however, um, in the fight against, uh, Lerone Murphy, he was taken down, got hit from full guard. He had a very active guard and Lerone Murphy kind of had no business trying to take the fight down to the mat, to be quite honest with you. Takes down Hikado Hamos for some reason. We're all left confused. All of a sudden he's hammer fisting him in the face and all of a sudden Hikado Hamos is unconscious. So by the way, Lerone Murphy, oh geez, there's a big bug on my notes that scared the crap out of me. Where'd that come from? Anyway. I get distracted really easily. Um, in his last fight against Bill Algio, he won a unanimous decision, landed eight takedowns in that fight, leading to 29-28 and 230-27 judges' scorecards. 73% takedown defense rate for Hikado Hamos, which will be very important in this fight against Abir Tuhugov. Uh, if he can keep the fight standing on the feet, um, this fight's going to be rather interesting. I really wonder who's going to have the uh, striking advantage in this one. Part of me... I, I think Tehugov has the striking advantage in this one. Uh, Hikado Hamos, he's kind of been known to actively only look for the big knockouts and stuff. So he'll surrender. He actually absorbs more strikes than he lands. And 41% significant strike accuracy rate for Hikado Hamos could cause some issues for him in this fight. However, 57% significant strike defense rate. Um, 3.08 takedown average for 15 minutes for Hikado Hamos, which is extremely high. At a 58% success rate. Um, he's got a very good calf kick as well. Look for that. Nice reversals off his back. Nice spinning elbow. Whenever they're clinched up, he's going to throw that spinning elbow. Okay, Whenever they're caught in that clinch position on the break, he loves to spam it. Ever since he got the Amy and Zahabi knockout, you know, he can end the fight early with that. If he can end the fight now with a spinning back elbow, he's going to take that opportunity. 
Maybe Tuhugov is going to recognize that and try to change levels, take the fight down to the mat. And how well can uh, Tuhugov keep off the uh, Black Bumpers Lane Jiu-Jitsu and Nikata Hamos? But I believe Tuhugov, I think he's got the better striking in this fight, or at least good enough against Ikado Hamos. Uh, if the fight does remain standing, and I think he's going to win a lot of the grappling exchanges. I'm not sure if he's going to win the win the takedown exchanges, if he's going to get the de- fight down repeatedly time and time after again. I'm not sure if he's going to do that, which will make this fight a little bit interesting. There's a darn good reason why this fight's close on the odds, um, despite the Russian name. Which, when you have that Russian name, the odds makers, you get a nice bump from the odds makers. That's always the case. So, there's a reason why these fights are really close, and I like this fight a lot. I like this fight a lot. I'm thinking Tuhugov in this one. Whiteboard gang, what's up, Heath Moore? Tuhugov, unanimous decision. Volkov is high levels above to uh, Tiberia. Hasbula. Just wait. Just wait, my friend. All right. The feature bout on the prelims for some reason. The women's strawweight division. Amanda Hibas taking on Verna Jandy Roba. Amanda Hibas 10-2 in her MMA career. Three knockouts, four submissions, three decision victories. Jandy Roba 17-2. With one knockout, three, 13 submission victories, and three decision victories. Amanda Hibas, 5'4", 66-inch reach. Jandy Roba, 5'3", 64-inch reach. For Jandy Roba, she's 3-2 in her UFC career, losing to Carla Esparza via unanimous decision, defeated Mallory Martin via round two, Renee Kachog, defeated Felice Herrig via armbar, lost to Mackenzie Dern, and then won her last fight against Kanaka Murato via round two, TKO, Dr. Stoppage. Was 14-0 prior to her UFC debut, was, was 3-0 and in Invicta, Picking up the strawweight championship there and defended it one time. Uh, defeated Mizuki Enue via split decision to win um, to win the championship. But defended it once via round two arm triangle choke. She's got eight first round finishes. Every single one of them via submission. She's a black belt, black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with 13 submissions. Seven rear naked chokes, a triangle choke, and four arm bars and an arm triangle. Was a Cerqueto MNA DMMA 115 pound champion. That's one of those organizations that I do see, by the way. I just choose not to talk about it because I can't pronounce it very well. Uh, Lands 2.65, significant strikes per minute, absorbs 2.92. So she's at a deficit. Does land 2.5 takedowns per 15 minutes at a 53% accuracy rate. Uh, However, she struggled to get it against a girl like Mackenzie Dern, by the way. Playing MMA math here, Amanda Hebus should win this fight because she has a victory over Mackenzie Dern. So if you're playing the MMA math game here, Amanda Hebus should win this fight based on that reason alone. Uh, the Morato fight, by the way, even though that was a doctor stoppage in that fight, you might think that she cut her open with an elbow or something like that. Nah, she dislocated the elbow. And Tanaka, or um, Murato, she's so freaking game. She went back to her corner, was completely ready to fight with her arm dangling like Jamal Hills against Paul Craig. And this was just a couple of weeks after that too. So it was kind of jarring to see it just back to back like that. And she's totally ready to go. So it was. Te- I-, I think that should be ruled like a technical submission, but nonetheless, it was a doctor stoppage, I guess, because she broke her arm. Amanda Hibas, four and one in her UFC career, defeated Emily Whitmire via round two, Renee Choke, defeated Mackenzie Dern via unanimous decision, defeated Rotten Marcos via unanimous decision, defeated Paige Van Zant, lost to Marina Rodriguez in her last fight via round two TKO. She was the former Jungle Fight Women's Strawweight Champion. So we have the Jungle Fight Strawweight Champion and Invicta Strawweight Champion, and to add to that, Sir Cir- Cirqueto. MNA, day MMA, 115 pound champion. So, it's a good organization, I guess, being represented. Uh, she also holds a round one knee bar win against Ariane Carnalosi um, way back in September 2014. She's also a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with four submissions, two Renegade chokes, an arm bar, and a knee bar. She's also a black belt in Judo. Uh, she was also the Max Fight Strawweight Champion, was supposed to face Angela Hill May 5th, but COVID forced that fight away, and then they had to reschedule it to June 5th. And then they canceled that fight due to lingering COVID symptoms for Amanda Hiba. So here she is taking on Verna Jandy Roba. Jandy Roba coming into this fight ranked number 12. By the way, Amanda Hiba, she outstrikes her opponents 4.25 to 1.78. That's a plus 2.47 significant strike def- differential. Put start number three in strawweight history. And that's the second lowest strike absorption rate in strawweight history. Lands 2.31 takedowns per 15 minutes. 85% takedown accuracy rate. That ain't right. That's significant strike accuracy. No, 85% takedown accuracy rate. Uh, 71 significant strike defense rate. I think Amanda Hebus is going to be able to keep this fight standing. She was able to do it against Mackenzie Dern. I don't think Jandy Robo is going to be able to take this fight down to the mat, to be quite honest with you. I think Amanda Hebus keeps it standing and grinds out a unanimous decision to victory on the feet. I think she's got 
definitely a wide margin uh, in the stand-up department compared to Jandy Roba. Jandy Roba will desperately need to try to take this fight down to the mat. And if she can, I'm sure Amanda Hibas can kind of handle some of those grappling exchanges. Um, but if she makes one wrong move, Jandy Robo will take an arm or a neck. She's been no, she's very much known to do that, okay? She's definitely one of the more dangerous uh, submission practitioners, not just in the women's uh, strawweight division, but in women's uh, on all women's divisions in general, definitely one of the major threats. So um, I do think Amanda Hibas is going to be able to handle that pretty well. Um, yeah, that's one of the more solid picks. The odds are pretty close for this one. Amanda Hibas minus 160. Verna Jandy Robo plus 140, so comparatively very close. That's the fight that's headlining the prelims. This main card is absolutely freaking stacked. You know, just looking at this card um, from bottom to the top, I can't sit here and tell you that this undercard is stacked by any means. There's some great names coming out of it, but it's it's definitely not. I don't. There's a couple of them, I guess. Lerone Murphy is going to be one of the bigger names if he's able to get past Maquan Americani, um, and, and definitely, definitely Albert Duraev. Um, like again, again, conductor of the hype train there. But beyond that, a lot of fighters that haven't fought in some time. Lots of mismatches. Um, Benoit Saint Denis. I'm, I'm excited to see him in his UFC debut. I wonder how he's going to be ha- going to be able to handle a guy with the experience of Zaleski dos Santos. Um, Andre Petrovsky against Hao Yao Zhang, even though that's not a very high profile fight and maybe doesn't have the best implications for the future of uh, 185 pounds. It's still an intriguing fight. Hao Yao Zhang. Got to represent China, man. The Those Chinese fighters are not doing good lately. Uh, oh, Demirius Magulov might be one of the bigger names. So there are a lot of, like, single talented fights on this card, but I'm not sure if I can sit here and tell you that there's, like, absolute bangers, like, can't-miss fights. Uh, so, yeah, just a lot of talent from local Russian areas. Lots of fighters that haven't fought in some time that came in with a lot of hype and just haven't been able to live up to it. But... Definitely don't miss out on these. Definitely don't miss out on these. I do think there are a couple of big names on these undercards. And they could prove me wrong, too. These guys have the potential. Uh, the only reason why I'm a little bit disappointed in them is because they haven't lived up to that potential quite yet. Uh, I do think there's a little bit of that Russian bias as well on this undercard. Uh, that helps a lot out a lot of these fighters. Whenever you're associated with Habib, you, you, whenever you get touched by him, you're golden. Um, but anyway, this main card, however, is stacked very very stacked we kick it off in the 205 pound division between number seven rate mega man and kalayev and number eight rank vulcan ozdemir and normally i i'm pretty confident in my picks i'm like i don't let outside influence uh influence me at all i don't let outside opinions i'm pretty steady even i got my notes i got my research this is my pick i went with ozdemir but everybody else convinced me otherwise. So I'd be really kicking myself if Ozdemir does get it done. And in fact, I think a lot of people are counting out Vulcan Ozdemir in this fight. He's a plus 245 underdog. Mega Man Ankoliev, minus 310 favorite. Ankoliev, he's 15-1 and one in his MMA career with nine knockouts, six decision victories. He stands at six foot three and has a 75-inch reach. Ozdemir, 6'1", 75-inch reach. So identical reach between the two of them. Uh, let's start off with uh, Mega Man Ankoliev. I want to start off with him real quick. And Kalaev, he's 6-1 in his UFC career. And that one lone loss was kind of a, just a – it was a beginner's move on his part. He was dominating the fight against Paul Craig. Literally last second, last 10 seconds, Paul Craig throws up a triangle. If he had waited less than like a half a second, he would have won the fight. But he freaking tapped. There was no reason to tap there, dude. No reason to tap. You were dominating the fight. You weren't tired. You weren't getting beaten up. You weren't looking for a way out of it. Why did you tap? It was a triangle choke, okay? Survive a couple more seconds. Now, maybe he didn't hear the 10 second, you know, the... Just... When you're that close, just don't tap to a triangle choke, okay? But he tapped to the triangle choke against Paul Craig. Paul Craig pulled off the greatest comeback in lightweight heavyweight history, uh, statistically, anyway. In my opinion, one of the greatest comebacks in MMA history. I mean, it was literally, it was the last second in a fight that he was getting dominated in. Like, sure, he wasn't bloodied up. It wasn't like Anderson Silva against Chael Sonnen, where, no, it, 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 was, it was better than that, okay? He was losing that fight. Literal last second, okay? Buzzer beater. Literally, tap. Referee calls it. The buzzer goes off. 
buzzer beater triangle from Paul Cray. Paul Cray is just a straight up savage, by the way. I love that guy to death. Um, Martin Prakno. Uh, you should run demo tapes to show to media companies. I, I, I never thought about that, actually. Anyway, um, I do appreciate that, Heath Moore, by the way. I heard uh, Yuri is in Fight Island as a replacement for this title fight if, it, if anything happens. I don't think anything's going to happen, to be quite honest with you. Okay, Ankalaev, after that fight, knocked out Marcin Prokno in the first round, defeated Klitz in a break of unanimous decision, defeated Dolce Yogambula via round one knockout, defeated Ian Kutalaba via knockout, did it again via knockout, first round, defeated Nikita Krylov in his last fight in February 2021. Nikita Krylov has definitely become a solid gatekeeper in the division, even though he might not have the name recognition. Like, they tried to put Glover Teixeira in that role of gatekeeper, but obviously here he is fighting for the world championship. Nikita Krylov is a very good fighter. Do you think Volkan Ozdemir is a huge step up in competition, however, for uh, Mega Man and Kaliath? He's an international master of sport and amateur MMA, master of sport and combat sambo, 8-3 and three in his amateur career, began at 0-3 and, and won 8 straight, became a Russian national champion in amateur uh, MMA. Um... It was 9-0 prior to his UFC debut. His opponents had a combined record of 100 wins and 40 losses, averaging 11-4 record. Very impressive there. His stats going into this fight, he lands 3.41 significant strikes per minute, only absorbs 1.78, 85% takedown defense rate, 53% significant strike accuracy rate, 65% significant strike defense rate is extremely high. 1.8 takedown average per 15 minutes. Uh, at a 33% takedown accuracy rate, 1.18 knockdown average for 15 minutes, five knockdowns in his UFC career in his seven fights. Volkan Ozmir, five and four in his UFC career, defeated Ovin Say, previous split decision, defeated Misha Serkinov in 28 seconds, defeated Jimmy Mandela in just 42 seconds. 2017 breakthrough fight of the year, fighter of the year, won all these accolades. He only had three fights in the UFC. They fed him to Daniel Cormier. And even Daniel Cormier knew, like, this was a mismatch. Everybody kind of knew that going into it. Like, maybe he had a puncher's chance. But even then, like, come on. You knocked out Jimmy Manawa. Jimmy Manawa is freaking good, okay? I don't mean to under, understate uh, how good Jimmy Manawa is. But to take on a guy like Daniel Cormier was just a terrible stylistic match for him. It was not great. And then Anthony Smith. Um... Really, really put the brakes on Volkan Ozdemir. Um, Anthony Smith won that fight via round three. Marina Kachok, and that was a straight-up not good fight for Volkan Ozdemir. And then he loses a split decision to Dominic Reyes, which a lot of people had Ozdemir winning that fight, including myself. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, Dominic Reyes, he lost to Volkan Ozdemir, so he lost to John Jones. No, that just shows how much John Jones sucks, okay? He lost to a guy that lost to Volkan Ozdemir, okay? Anyway, um, I, I, I was being a bit aggressive there, okay? <laughs> but anyway, uh, defeated Alito Latifi after that via knockout, defeated Alexander Rakic uh, via split decision, and lost to Yuri Prohatska. His stock went way down after that second round knockout, but a lot of people forget. I mean, it was a close first round. He was losing. He was losing that fight. But against the season striker in Yuri Prohatska, and he got put to bed in that fight. That was over a year ago, though. I think that influenced a lot of people's picks on this one, I'll be quite honest with you guys. And... Not often do I get buzzed, but I was going with Ozdemir in this fight. I was. I was. But I got I have to swallow my pride a little bit here. This is one of those hipster picks. I wasn't budging on the Americani pick. I had to budge on this one. People want Ankalaev to win this fight. People think Ankalaev's going to win this fight. People see him as this dark horse in the division. Yes, he'll be all of that if he beats Volkan Ozdemir. I do not see him as this guy yet, to be quite honest with you guys. Volkan Ozdemir is a very seasoned striker, and a lot of people see him as just a big knockout artist, and that, I don't see that at all. He's a, he, he can fight technically as well, uh, but if uh, Ankalaev makes one mistake, he can be unconscious for sure, but Volkan Ozdemir, he can fight technical as well. Um, he lands 5.03 significant strikes per minute as Ozdemir and absorbs 4.24. Uh, 55% uh, significant strike def uh, defense rate, 80% takedown defense rate, so if Ankalaev wants to take that fight down to the mat... Ozmir does have a great takedown defense rate. This fight's way closer than people think. Way closer. And I'm going to say Ankali or I'm going to say Ozdemir, but everybody else says no, no, no. It's it's Ankali. Shut up. I I see that Russian name, okay? It's going to be Ankali. He's 6 and 1 in the UFC, 6 fight win streak. Basically undefeated, okay? 1 second away from being undefeated. Okay, all that's great. Volkan Ozmir, very very seasoned striker. 
Very good take down the fence. I really wonder who's going to win the striking exchanges in this fight. I think it's going to be a lot closer than people think. A lot closer. What do you guys think? Am I crazy there? I really think goes from here. In fact, this might be one of those fights where I, I'm too stubborn, man. I really, real. This was last second. Okay, I was think picking Ozmir, picking Ozmir, but all the experts are saying Ankalaev, and I just don't see why. Really, the only argument was he's the dark horse in the division. His striking is really good. His takedowns are really good. But Ozdemir's got a good answer for all that. I think a lot of people are forgetting how good Ozdemir is. But you got to remember, the people that he's losing to, Daniel Cormier, just terrible matchup, Anthony Lionheart-Smith, Dominic Reyes, Yuri Prochazka, okay, he's not losing to bums. A lot of people think Dominic Reyes is a bum. Dominic Reyes went on to defeat John Jones after that fight. Okay, I like Ozdemir. You know what? Do I change it right now? This would be a first for me. The only reason why I'm putting Inka Live up there is because everybody else is saying it. And in fact, speaking of everybody else, look at the tapology votes. Give me two seconds here. Now, to be fair, there are some very sus picks from this uh, tapology community. The, the tapology community did not have a very good showing on this card, in my opinion. Then again, I could be very wrong. I could definitely bat below 90%, or de definitely bat below 50%. Look at that. 91% are picking Ankalaev. Over half of them by knockout. Hell, there are people picking him via submission. He doesn't have a submission. Okay, 4%. The bar is a little bit wrong there. But Ozdemir, a lot by knockout, a couple by decision. Dude, I got Ankalaev. He's a beast. That's the only argument, though. He's a beast. That's it. That's not good enough for me. Screw that. I'm going Ozdemir. I'm changing it now. <laughs> and really, because I think Ozdemir has got the stand. I think if this is if this is a technical battle, which I think it is, Ozdemir might have the advantage. Um, and Kaliev is a little bit bigger. I think Ozdemir can keep the fight standing. Literally, that was a last second change on my part, but I'm changing it back. I'm going with my gut. Vulcan Ozdemir via unanimous decision. I think it will be a technical battle. And I, I just haven't seen much from Ankalaev. Um, if People forget how good Vulcan Ozdemir is on the feet. And if this fight is going to be largely standing, which I think it is, this is a really freaking close fight. And perhaps a little bit of a hipster pick here. But I'm going with Vulcan Ozdemir. I changed my mind. No, I'm I changed my mind back, okay? I'm going with it. But man, I might be kicking myself if... Um, if Mega Man Ankalaev goes out and starches him in the first round, which is also possible. Stick with your guns, figuratively, of course. Figuratively, going with it. All right, but I do like that fight a lot. But I do think it's a big step up in competition. I do think, aside from the Nikita Krylov fight, this is the first real test for Mega Man Ankalaev. And I'm not sure if he's quite ready for it, to be quite honest with you. Uh, I think it's Ozdemir got a good chance of winning. I, I agree with you, man. I agree with you. Uh, if the numbers are right, that's bad matchmaking. If the, if the numbers are right, the uh, the odds maker plus two forty five for Volkan Ozdemir, minus three ten for Ankalaev. I think that's insane to me. I, I really do. All right. Speaking of odds being heavily skewed in one direction, Hamzat Chemaev from Chechnya, Russia, grew up in Sweden, taking on Li Jingliang, the leech from China, eighteen and six in his MMA career. Hamzat Chemaev nine and zero. Oh. Tamayev with a 100% finishing rate with nine knockouts, three submissions, minus 590 favorite going into this fight. Li Jing Liang plus 425 underdog. You know, I'm telling you guys, I do think Hamza Tamayev's going to win this fight. Pretty much based on the fact that he's a bad stylistic matchup, in my opinion, for Li Jing Liang. I do think he's going to take the fight down to the mat and have his way with him on the ground. The only reason why I'm picking unanimous decision is because I'm not fully on board until, like, obviously, if this were 2020 again and he didn't have COVID. We might be looking at a different pick on my part here. But with Chemayev, with the COVID situation, I mean, there was a point where he was coughing up blood and talking about retirement. We've kind of just swept that under the rug. We're like, okay, we don't we don't remember that, okay? We don't remember that. We're not looking at it. We're not looking at it. That was a real thing, okay? And I, I do believe that he wouldn't be taking this fight if he wasn't 100%. He knows the reputation that he has to live up to. Uh, for Chimaev, 3-0 in his UFC career. Defeated John Phillips via Darst Show. Defeated Rice McKee. Was a minus 12 favorite, 1,200 favorite going into that fight. Finished that fight via round one TKO. Uh, defeated Ger Gerald Mershart in just 17 seconds. Dude, 
I, I kind of had to be reminded of why this guy had so much hype. And when you watch his fights, dude, I missed them all, man. If there's one thing that I wish I could have watched in 2020, it would have been Steve Favors DC3. But beyond that, the rise of Hamza Chemaev is one of those one thing that caught me way off guard. I wasn't expecting that expecting that to pop up. But you want to know something too? His dominance isn't just in MMA. He was 23-0 and 0 in his freestyle wrestling career. Granted, it was in the country of Sweden, which isn't really necessarily known for its... It's got some good wrestlers, but it's not really known for its high level... Oh, geez, I didn't realize my uh, screen was still up. My bad. But the Chimaya fight, my bad. 23-0, and 0, undefeated freestyle wrestling. 14 technical falls. <laughs> 14. If you guys don't know what a technical fall is, it's a mercy rule is what it is. I think it's 10 points you're beating your opponent by. 10, 14 technical falls, 7 falls, 7 pins. He's outpointed his opponents in wrestling a whopping 163 to 8. <laughs> I, I want to pull this up, man, because these are insane numbers. This dude has ran through everybody in his entire combat sports career. I mean, this is hysterical. Look at this. Now, granted... Sweden doesn't necessarily have the greatest of wrestling programs out there. But look, Tech Fall, Tech Fall, 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 Tech Fall, 14 to 4 to win the championship or whatever tournament this was. Tech Fall, 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 4 to nothing. Technical Fall in the championship. SM Nationals, whatever this is. Technical Fall, Technical Fall, Technical Fall, Pin, Fall, Technical Fall, Solo Cup, SM Nationals, Fall, Technical Fall, Technical Fall, Technical Fall, Technical Fall, Technical Fall, Shutout. Dude, I mean, those numbers are insane, man. And I'm sure if he had committed to that a little bit, he would have been competing in the Olympics for um, representing Sweden, I'm sure, in freestyle wrestling. Uh, after that, 3-0 in his amateur career, finished all three of those fights. But really, it's his um, it was Brave Combat Fighting Championships. Dominated there. Made his middleweight debut against John Phillips. Even knocked out Gerald Mershar and... A lot of people were improperly criticizing Gerald Mershart because they automatically look at Hamza Chimaev and assume that Gerald Mershart's a bum. He's not, dude. That's the only. That's the third time he's ever been knocked out in his a long career. Okay, three knockouts. That's in three knockout losses in forty-seven matches. Even though he was knocked out by Ian Heinish shortly before that. Okay, that takes the wind out of my sails a little bit. But again, that's against Ian Heinish. Okay, Hamza Chimaev is a welterweight. So, um, he's got good stand-up, good power in his hands. Lands a whopping 9.03 significant strikes per minute. He's only landed, he's only absorbed one. In his first three fights in the UFC, he's only absorbed one significant strike. He's outstruck his opponents 87-1 to in the significant strike department. 196-2 to in the total strike department. I mean, these numbers are insane. Uh, I'm sure you guys have watched this, watched his fights before, so I'm not going to get down and dirty on him, but he's 4-0 as a middleweight, 4-0 as a 170-pounder, 1-0 as a 176 catchweight fighter. Lee Jing Liang, we should focus on him a little bit, 9-4 in his UFC career, he defeated David Mashad, fellow Sioux Falls fighter, uh, won the fight via split decision back in May 2014, lost to Nordin Taleb, defeated Diego Lima via round one knockout, lost to Kira Nakimura, you know, I'm just going to pull up his record here so we can take a look at it together. Now, after this, he won a pretty solid win streak. Defeat Odson, Anton Severe via knockout. Bobby Nash via knockout. Frank Camacho via decision. Zach Otto via TKO. Lost to Jake Matthews. Defeated Diachi Abe via an decision. Defeated David Zawada via TKO. Defeated Eliza Zaleski to Santos. Lost to Neil Magny. That's an important fight. Remember that one? Whoops. And then defeated Santiago Ponzinibbio in his last fight via round one knockout in January of this year. All of a sudden, he's fighting Hamza Chemaev, which kind of caught me off guard a little bit here. Uh, he's ranked number 11 at 170. Hamza Chemaev, three fights in the UFC. I mean, really show. I mean, he knocked out Gerald Mershart in 17 seconds. Okay, that's fair. Um, Lee Jin Liang is also a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, by the way, with four submissions, all four of them via guillotine. 59% takedown defense rate for Lee Jin Liang. We saw that in the um, Neil Bagney fight. It was taken down repeatedly there. And the uh, Ponzinibbio fight, both fighters missed with overhand rights, and he came back up with a left hook right on the chin, knocked him out cold. Was 8-2 prior to the UFC, fought in Legend Fighting Championship in China, won the promotion, 
promotions, 170 pound championship there. Won the China Open Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Championship as a purple belt uh, in the Absolute Division and the 92 Kilo Division as well. Um, but yeah, Magni landed four takedowns, controlled him for five minutes and six seconds. I think Kamza Chimaya is going to come out of this fight and try to take him down right out of the gate. I'm actually picking it, Chimaya to be a decision in this one, partially because... I just don't know what what to expect from Hamza Chimaev with this whole COVID situation. Maybe he's not going to be as explosive. I think that's just a safe pick. I'd be, and that implies if I go with a round one knockout for Chimaev or a submission or what have you, that implies that Li Jingliang is not good. Okay, this guy's really freaking good. This is a very competitive fight. Again, the odds are skewed heavily in favor of Chimaev on that name recognition alone and how dominant he has been in the UFC. Um, and I am picking Chimaev. I do think he's the better fighter in this fight, but not by minus 590, okay? In a perfect world, I'd say more like minus 240, okay? Uh, it's that name recognition for sure. People have betting heavily on Hamza Chimaev. And wh- wh- what does the topology community say? I'm pretty sure it's very, very heavy in the fa- in the court of uh, Hamza Chimaev. There might be a few people out there picking Li Jing Liang. Oh, there's a couple out there. But roughly 86% picking uh, Hamza Chimaev. For the people picking Li Jingliang, they're actually picking him via knockout, which it seems like he would need a knockout. He would need to take out Hamza Chimaev. And if he's able to do that, Li Jingliang is a new superstar. Uh, if he's able to knock out Hamza Chimaev. But Chimaev, 55% by knockout, 25% by submission, only 15% by decision. Uh, I'm picking him via decision in this one. Um, based solely because I just don't know what to expect from him. I can't imagine he's going to come into this fight better than he was before. Um, I don't think he's going to come into this fight. The 2020 Hamza Chimaev that we remember. So I do think a little bit of win is going to be taken out of his sales from that COVID situation. Coming back from that. Fighting in a crowd in Abu Dhabi on the main event of a pay-per-view. Lots of eyes on him. But he seems to enjoy this process. So I don't think the pressure is going to get to him at all. So we really come into, or we really, this really comes down to like a physicality factor. Um, how can he physically recover from COVID and ring rust is a real thing. How will he be able to handle that? Obviously he handled his UFC de- debut just fine, but he's not taking on John Phillips. He's taking on Li Jing Liang. This is going to be a com- more competitive fight than people realize. But I do think Amza Chimaev is a good stylistic fight for him. And I do think he gets it done. Um, Minus 590, though, I understand why. I understand why, but I don't agree with it. Minus 590 is insane, even though I am picking him to win. It's not a hill I'm willing to die on. Uh, we just don't know. We just don't know what, what we don't know. He could come back into this fight. Like, I compare him. Remember the 2020 fight of the year, Kevin Holland? Look at what he's doing in 2021. There could be, like, a 2020 curse or something. I don't know. Agree, Cube. I hope it's competitive, but nice to see what Hamzad has got. Simple f- choice for Hamzad if he's heavy, wrestling pan plan he shall win i agree uh hamza lee by third round tko that that would mostly depend on hamza chmaev uh if it's a third on knockout for lee jing liang hamza chmaev would have run himself into the ground we don't really know what his gas tank is like and i can't imagine uh how good it might be during this covid situation but we'll see but i like hamza chmaev a lot i'm definitely riding the hype train too i like hype trains okay hype trains are fun people Always like to criticize hype trains for whatever reason. Just enjoy the process, okay? A lot of people are criticizing Patty Pimblett for some reason. He's a fun fighter. He had a fun fight against Luigi Vendramini. Hamza Chimaev has been dominant his first three UFC fights. We're very blessed to be able to watch him. Bo free! Bo free! Love that fight. Great way to kick off. That fight should be the curtain jerker in my opinion. But it's not a pay-per-view though. It's a fight night. Dude, this is a fight night. We're talking about here the greatest fight night in the history of fight nights. It really is what we have here. All right, the next fight, perhaps a wild card pick once again for Mr. T Bone MMA here. Um, Marcin Tibera, ranked number eight, number five ranked Alexander Volkov from Russia, thirty three and nine record for uh, Volkov. Twenty two knockouts, three submission victories, eight decision victories for Marcin Tibera, twenty two and six with nine knockouts, six submissions, and seven decision victories. Tibera plus two thirty underdog. Uh, Alexander Volkov minus 290 favorite. I'll be honest with you guys. A lot of people picking uh, Volkov via knockout in this fight. I think that's an insane pick, to be quite honest with you guys. But that's just me. Marcin Tibera, let's take a look at his career. Kind of a career resurgence. He's trying to pull off a little uh, Glover Teixeira action here with the career resurgence he's got. 
We're going back to his UFC debut way back in the day in 2016 where he defeated Victor Pesta via round two head kick knockout. Pesta, one of the worst fighters in UFC history, though. Defeated Luis Enrique via TKO. Lost, or defeated Andre Olovsky. So he really came to the UFC. He was one of the more breakthrough studs that the heavyweight division at the time desperately needed. And then he lost to Fabrice over Doom via unanimous decision. I believe that was Verdum's like first or second fight after losing the title to Stipe. Stipe, Travis Brown. Okay, it wasn't. It was a fair bit after that. I forgot he had that majority decision loss against Overeem. I thought he won that fight. Um, that's why it confused me a little bit. But that was when Verdum was still Verdum. And then he lost to Derek Lewis in a fight that he was dominating. And Derek Lewis, Derek Lewis him. Uh, and then he defeated Stefan Struve via an decision, lost to Shamil Abdurahimov via TKO, and lost to Augusto Sakai via round one knockout in the first minute of that fight. But since then, defeated Sergei Spivak via an decision, defeated Maxine Grishin via an decision, defeated Ben Rothwell via an decision, TKO'd Greg Hardy, TKO'd Walt Harris. Both of these fights kind of in similar fashion. For Alexander, Alexander I almost said Alexander the Great, Alexander Volkov, Driving Drago. He made his UFC debut against Timothy Johnson. Most recently, he just got knocked out by Fedor, old Tim Johnson. Won that fight via split decision. and defeated Roy Nelson. Knocked out Stefan Struve. Knocked out Fabrizio Verdum. That is when he got put on the map, ladies and gentlemen. That's when I was fully on the hype train there. I was like, Volkov's going to win the championship. He's going to go up, go out there. I love Stipe to death, but I thought he was going to beat Stipe. That dude looks so good against Fabrizio Verdum. And that was when Verdum was still Verdum, by the way. He looked sensational against Derek Lewis until he got knocked out. Okay, great. You got knocked out by Derek Lewis. Whatever. Derek Lewis, just Derek Lewis him. Whatever. Volkov is still a better fighter, okay? And then he had that weird decision victory over Greg Hardy. Greg Hardy taking the fight on short notice. You know, Greg Hardy forever has my respect for taking on Alexander Volkov on that short notice. <laughs> Uh, and then lost to Curtis Blades in just an overall bad stylistic matchup. Curtis Blades took him down many, many times. After that, hit a beautiful front teep to the body on Walt Harris and finished him on the ground. And the Alistair Overeem fight just out kickboxed Alistair Overeem. Out, out back on the Volkov hype train. And then Surreal Gone just derailed that pretty handily in that fight. I believe that was 50 45. Yeah, 50-45, 50-45, and 49-46. That was a very freaking impressive victory for Surreal Gone. Um, earned performance of the night. Dude, he looks sensational against Alistair Overeem. However, for Volkov, the uh, one Achilles heel. I mean, not necessarily Achilles heel. His takedown defense rate has been fine um, since that. Uh, maybe I'm placing too much, too much emphasis on that Curtis Blades fight. However, just look at his takedown defense rate, 67%. However... A lot of that is heavily skewed due to the Curtis Blades fight. Again, Curtis Blades, 14 of 25 on his takedowns. And Volkov still won a couple rounds in that one. Um, the only route to victory here is Marcin Tibera. He For Ty Tibera, he needs to get the fight down to the mat. Absolutely has to. And I think he will. I really do. I think he will get that, the fight down to the mat. He's going to clinch up with Alexander Volkov. I don't think Volkov is going to knock out Marcin Tibera unless Marcin Tibera makes uh, several mistakes, several critical mistakes. And uh, if he's unable to get the fight down to the mat um, and gets tired, Volkov starts picking him apart, picking him apart shots to the body. And then if Marcin Tibera ends up being a T or a golf ball on the edge of a T, uh, Volkov is going to hit him as many times as he darn well pleases. So that could cause some issues. But definitely a wild card pick here for Marcin Tiberia. 1.67 takedown average at a 45% takedown accuracy rate, which just puts him at number nine in heavyweight history. 82% takedown defense rate is number one in heavyweight history. I just thought I'd throw it in there. I don't think it applies to this one. 50% significant strike accuracy rate, only 55% significant strike defense rate. Um, in the Walt Harris fight, he survived an initial onslaught after that, eventually got the bat, got the TKO, and got ground and pound for the TKO. Um, in his losses, either he gets caught or he gets completely overwhelmed. Um, a couple of records. He's tied with the nine longest win streak in heavyweight history with five. Uh, 53 minutes and one second of control time, number six in heavyweight history. Number three in heavyweight history for top control time at 39 minutes and 47 seconds. Number 10 most significant strikes land in heavyweight history at 619. Number six total strikes at 1,167. Number nine most takedowns in heavyweight history with 19. 
Uh, for Volkov, a couple of stats to throw out there. 4.84 significant strikes landed per minute. Absorbs 2.88. Excuse me. Uh, 57% or 67% takedown defense rate. 57% significant strike accuracy rate. 54% significant strike uh, uh, defense rate. Uh, 15 minute, 20 second average fight time. No gas tank issues for Volkov. Uh, 802 significant strikes, number five in heavyweight history, plus 2.11 significant strike differential, which puts him at number four in heavyweight history. Uh, 1,016 1, total strikes puts him at number eight in heavyweight history. Imagine he buzz laugh as your alarm. I don't. <laughs> Marcin's a good dog pick. He could use his wrestling and could get a decision. I mean, that's definitely one of those, yeah, it's a stylistic matchup uh, that could go heavily in favor of one of the other fighters. And you're going to find out pretty darn quick where the direction of the fight's going to go. If Marcin Tiberio can get the fight down once, he's probably going to be able to get it down again and again and again. Now, Volkov, after the Derek Lewis, or pardon me, after the Curtis Blades fight, definitely bulked up a little bit. He doesn't look like the same fighter physically. So he needs that against a guy like Marcin Tiberia, and that's something that Volkov does. He'll lose weight in fights that he needs to be a little bit faster in, and he gains weight in fights that he needs to be heavier in. He's kind of a unique type of fighter. By the way, he's six foot seven, has an 80 inch reach, but Tiberia is also a big guy at 6'3, 78 inch reach. So Tiberia, he needs to walk through some of the big shots from Volkov. I don't think Volkov's going to finish Marcin Tiberia. Um. Volkov, he either needs to catch Tiberia. I don't see him overwhelming him with shots unless Tiberia just gets so physically exhausted. I don't see Volkov catching him with anything too big. Uh, we saw Volkov, again, most of the knockouts that he gets in the UFC, it's often overwhelming pressure that he gets and eventually puts you down from there and you can't really recover. Uh, very good kickboxer is Volkov. Marching Tiberia, good on the ground. He's a black belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu with six submissions, four winning a chokes, a triangle, and a north-south choke. What was the Tapology community saying about this one? Because I think I, more people, by the way, were picking, or I should say less people are picking Tibera in this fight than they are picking Islam, or about the same. 82% for Alexander Volkov, 18% for Marcin Tibera. I don't know. I like that wild card pick for Marcin Tibera. A lot of people picking Tibera via knockout, and I just don't see that. Only essentially only four percent have tibera via submission that's not a bad pick at all tibera via submission in fact if the odds are that if, if the odds are that what are the odds for a submission I'll, I'll look that up later the odds for a submission for uh marcin tibera those might not be bad odds to throw throw on if it's as low as i think it is it might be like my plus 1000 that's not a bad bet at all anyway i like that fight a lot Really determined, Marcin Tibera can perform, or if he can get this career resurgence, he's right up there with um, title shot. I think the title picture for Alexander Volkov, I think those days are behind him now. I think he's more of a gatekeeper in the division, unfortunately, as much as I love Volkov. But that last fight against Surreal Gone was not good, okay? So I think maybe the best day, I'm not saying the best days, like best performances. I still think he can perform at a high level, and maybe he can have a career resurgence. But for Volkov, he's got a loss against uh, Surreal Gone in pretty devastating fashion, and I just don't see how much upwards he can go. So I think this is a good style. I think this is a good matchup for the matchmakers, um, perhaps to keep Volkov in the top five. And for Tibera, if he's able to keep on winning, man, he's definitely one of the. I'm not gonna call him a dark horse because I don't see him taking the title anytime soon. But he kind of like over to Shara, man. Nobody saw that coming, and not a lot of people think he's the biggest threat to the to the champion, Jan Blahovic, but eventually he just kind of put himself in a number one contendership spot, and Marcin Tiberi can kind of do that. He's not a big name, not the most exciting fighter, but I think he might get it done against Volkov. Yeah, I appreciate it, Michael Alford, by the way. All right, perhaps the feature bout on this card really proves that people love to bet. I saw one poll out there. I saw Makhlchev against Dan Hooker, if you don't know what I'm talking about. People were, gosh, this is so silly. I saw one poll out there. This wasn't like, who do you want to win? Who do you think's going to win? 51% had Dan Hooker. That's insane to me, okay? Dan Hooker, yes, has a puncher's chance. That does not mean he has a good chance in this fight. Plus 460, the underdog is Dan Hooker. Minus 650 for Islam Makhlchev. Makhlchev, I said it before, I'll say it again. I think he's already the champ. I think he's the champion. I think he could be champion right now today. 
The only reason why he's not fighting for a world championship is because he just needs to have a couple of fights before you get there. There's, there's a process to this, okay? I think he's could face off against guys like Charles Oliveira and uh, Dustin Poirier and do very well. Michael Chandler, Justin Gaethje. He's got a... He's already up there. His name's already up there with those top guys. And ever since Habib started hanging out, I mean, they've been hanging out for a long time, but ever since Habib retired, people have been focusing on Islam Akhlachev. And everybody wants to see the new Habib, the new Habib, new Habib. This guy kind of freaking is, man. And I hate that term. I hate calling Hamza Chimaev Habib 2.0. I hate calling Islam Makhachev Habib 2.0. But there's this good freaking reason for Makhachev. Makachev, three knockouts, nine submissions, eight decision victories. He's 20 and one. Yeah, he got knocked out. The most fluky knockout you're ever going to see ever in MMA. It happened. But you guys don't even know who did it to him. And if you guys do, but you don't know where he's at now. Because I don't. Because he's retired. <laughs> he got cut from the UFC shortly after that. After losing a couple fights straight. But anyway, for Dan Hooker, 21 and 10. 10 knockouts, seven submissions, and four decision victories. Dan Hooker definitely has maybe a little bit more than a puncher's chance in this fight. He could definitely shut the lights out of Islam Makhachev. However, to do that, he needs to somehow fit that in in the in the average four strikes around that Islam Makhachev absorbs. I don't think Dan Hooker is going to run that number up at all. I think Makhachev is going to keep that number pretty steady at where it is a .77 significant strikes absorbed per minute. In, the UFC, in his UFC career so far. However, just one of those. We saw it. It can happen. The Adriano Martins fight. It happened. He got knocked out. Been dominant since then. Defeating Chris Wade. Defeated Nick Lentz. Defeated Gleason Tebow via knockout. Defeated John Johnson via round one armbar. Defeated Armin Saruki. And Armin Saruki kept the fight standing. and made that a competitive fight. Defeated Davi Hamos via unanimous decision. Defeated Drew Dober via round three arm triangle choke. Defeated Diego Moisés via round four rear naked choke. And a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, Dan Hooker, he's game and all that. He's not going to give up. A, a lot of times, this is on Akhachev, a lot of his submissions. He's dominating his opponents. Same thing with Habib. He's dominating his opponents. Eventually, he just gives something up, either the TKO or the re rear naked choke or something. There's like, ow, ow, you're hitting me. You're hitting me. Just please rear naked choke. I'm going to pretend I'm fighting. Pretend I'm fighting. Tap out or just go to sleep. To, I'm a warrior. I'm going to go to sleep. Now, I'm not fighting yet. I'm just going to – okay, here we go. Uh, that's a real thing, okay? People want to pretend they're warriors, and they're really not. I don't blame them against guys like Islam Makhachev. Dan Hooker is not going to give up at all in this fight. But Drew Dober didn't either, okay? Drew Dober's a savage mofo, and he tapped him out with an arm triangle from half guard, okay? That's a savage move right there. Tapping somebody out from half guard with an arm triangle, not just like three-quarter mount or three-quarter side control or something like that no he was on the opposite side dropping his shoulder down squeezing the hell out of drew dober and forced him to tap man that's some serious squeeze this guy's no freaking joke okay 0 0.77 significant strikes absorbed per minute is a number it's not even close to being been beaten number one in ufc history by point zero zero point two seven Number four longest win streak in lightweight history with eight. Would tie Charles Dubronx right now with number three longest in uh, in lightweight history. Number six most control time percentage in UFC or in lightweight history, 51.4%. Number three top position time, 45.4%. Number two striking accuracy rate at 58.8%. Number two take takedown accuracy rate at 65.7%. By the way, get, can you guess who number one is? For highest takedown accuracy rate, it's BJ Penn. <laughs> I just realized that now. Islam Makhachev is only 1% behind BJ Penn, so he might be able to run that number up. Went 5-0 in his M1 career. International Master of Sport and Combat Sambo. Uh, 2016 Combat Sambo World Champion. He's got nine submissions. Triangle choke, three naked chokes, three arm bars, an inverted triangle, and an arm triangle. For uh, Dan Hooker, 80% takedown defense rate. He's going to need every bit of that 80%. 4.95 significant strikes landed per 15 or per minute. Absorbs 4.66, however. He's only been taken down twice in his last 11 fights. Two out of 21 attempts. He's been taken down 12 times total. But two, he's at, he's had a 90% takedown defense rate. A little above. It's more like 91% in his last, 20, in his last uh, 11 fights. So something to note. 0.58 knockdown per 15 knockdowns per 15 minutes. Records number six most knockdowns, or pardon me, six knockdowns puts him at number 10 in lightweight history. 0.74 knockdown average in his 155 pound career puts him at number nine in 
uh, lightweight history. 5.88 significant strikes landed in his lightweight career. But to my number six, 90.5 rate takedown def- percent takedown defense rate. Puts him number three at 155 pounds. I don't care if it's 95, 90.5%. Samogatev's going to take him down in this fight repeatedly. And unless Dan Hooker can somehow time a big knee, which he's been known to do. He's got good knees. Uh, he knocked out Ross Pearson out cold. Knocked out his mouthpiece. I don't see it happening. Everybody thinks that ever since uh, Jorge Masvidal landed that flying knee against Ben Askin, that's a likely possibility. It's not. That's, that was a very fluky thing we saw. Very fluky thing. Dan Hooker's odds of winning this fight are extremely thin. Despite what um, the tapology community says. This is, just, this is just bonkers to me that so many people are picking Dan Hooker in this fight. 82% for Makhlchev. 18% for Hooker. Am I, am I not giving Hooker a good enough chance in this one? I'm giving him a puncher's chance. He can't knock him out. That, that should mean more like 1% or 2% are picking Dan Hooker in this one, okay? People don't understand it's MMA. Puncher's chances are very, very freaking rare. We saw it with Ray Cooper last night, but he was also winning in the grappling department. That fight was still pretty close, even though it was a big comeback. But Ray Cooper had a puncher's chance, and he knocked out that Russian. But do you guys think, uh, honestly, answer me. I'm sorry I haven't been interacting with you guys as much. Again, I usually try to keep these under two hours. I'm going to go over that, but we had 15 fights, okay? Give me a break. Um... That's the feature bout on the card. Okay, we're moving on to Cody Yon and Corey Sanhit. Am I giving him maybe a knee knockout? Exactly. There you go. Maybe a knee knockout. That's that's about it. I don't. Maybe I'm not giving Dan Hooker too much credit here, but he went from fighting Nasrat Hackbar. He went from fighting Michael Chandler, who wasn't even the UFC, got knocked out. Which Michael Chandler is still really good. Okay, that's fine. Then he fights Nasrat Hackbarast. Great win for him. Nasser Hackpress, up and coming prospect, but he was unranked at the time, and I, I don't see him reaching 155 pound rankings anytime soon. He went from facing a guy that's unranked to perhaps facing not only a, a perhaps future lightweight champion, but maybe one of the better lightweights we've ever seen. I'm going to put money on Hooker. I'm sure the payout will be good. There are better underdogs, to be quite honest with you, but yeah, the payout would be good. But the odds of that happening are so slim. There are better underdogs on this card. If you want to bet an under, underdog, Marching Tiberia is a solid pay, payout. Li Jing Liang, not a bad pick there. Maybe not. I don't know. But that's that's a good payout too. Both of them are more likely to win this fight than, than Dan Hooker. Okay, If you want to bet the underdog, there's a lot of good underdog picks on this card. Avoid this one. I understand the payout is good for this one. And Vegas will need all of it because I think there's going to be a lot of underdogs winning this card. Anyway, I'm going to move on to the top two fights. I broke these down. I broke these fights down much, much deeply. I'm just going to do a quick, quick. Um, I'm just going to explain my picks. That's it. Um, if you guys want my full in-depth discussion on it, check out my videos. Those videos didn't do so hot. So if you guys want to give a like and support those a little bit, that'd be much appreciated. But for Piotr Jan and Corey Sanhagen, I am going Corey Sanhagen. I'm compromising a little bit here via unanimous decision. I was originally going to pick him via knockout, but this is one of those situations where I'm like, I, I, I hate these types of arguments, okay? I hate them, hate them, hate them. I can make many arguments for Corey Sanhagen specifically because Piotr Jan, with that traditional boxing style that he has, the way that he presses forward, I think is going to be walking into a lot of big shots from Corey Sanhagen. Corey Sanhagen, by the way, by the way, the only counter argument that I have here, the, a lot of the arguments for Piotr Jan are this. Piotr Jan should be champion right now. I think he's going to beat Corey Sanhagen. That's it. Not a lot of people go into depth, depth about this at all. When you really look at this fight stylistically, okay, yeah, Piotr Jan's champion right now. Okay, no, he's not champion. He lost his title. Aljamain Sterling, by the way, these are Aljamain Sterling's kids we're talking about here, okay? Aljamain Sterling has a victory over the two of them. They're fighting for the interim championship. Corey Sanhagen beat TJ Dillashaw, though. I don't care what the judges said. He beat him in that fight, and that's why he's getting the 135-pound championship here, okay? This is my counter argument to anybody that says, oh, Corey Sanhagen doesn't deserve the fight because the judges said TJ won. Yes, the judges said TJ won. Corey Sanhagen won. You know why I know that? He tore his meniscus and tore his LCL with a heel hook. Beat the brakes off of him. 
Hit him with many good shots. Did more damage to TJ Dillashaw. TJ Dillashaw couldn't make this fight. In steps Corey Sanding. He didn't, didn't take any damage in that fight. The only damage that he took was right here. Body lock. Knees to the thigh. Knees to the thigh. That's it. That's it. That's the major damage he took in the entirety of that fight. I'm being a little bit exaggerating there. But finally, we agree. Sandpan. Uh, so Glover, uh, Glover and Hooker pull it off. You'll do a shoey. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. If Dan Hooker pulls it off, yeah, of course. Um, I'd be – I might pass out from pure – dude. Dude, I, I've seen – I saw Hidolfo Vieira get tapped, okay? Not much can surprise me here, but that would be very shocking if Dan Hooker can pull it off. And maybe I'm counting out – I'm totally counting out Dan Hooker way too much in this fight, but I just don't see it, guys. I just don't see it. I'm going to put my money on that hooker guy. He's a beast. I might as well just donate to this show because you're not going to see that money come back. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Um, but if he does pull it off, congrats. Good for you, man. It's, 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 it's not going to happen. Man. I'm just saying it's not going to happen. Okay. I'm here to focus on the San Hagen fight. Um, for Piotr Jan, his route to victory, I guess, Walking down Corey Sandhagen and hitting him with a big shot. I think that's extremely unlikely. Um, Corey Sandhagen. A lot of people, and a lot of it's MMA math. By the way, Piotr Jan, minus 235 favorite in this fight. Corey Sandhagen, plus 190 underdog. How I see this fight going, Piotr Jan's, you know, honestly here, I'm picking you, uh, uh, this is my official pick. If you're really asking me what I'm thinking here, I think Piotr Jan's going to walk into some big shots from Corey Sandhagen. I really do. The way that he plots forwards, a very traditional boxing style, dips his head, not only to the side, but he dips it forward, which is very good. If you're throwing a right cross at me and I'm dipping my head down, I don't have to worry about anything else because if you're throwing a right cross, what's he going to do? Throwing left hook or something? Yeah, maybe when I reset up here, but I'll be ready for it. I'll be ready when I have my hand up. Very good traditional boxing defense he's got. However, the reason why you don't see this very often in MMA, just ask Dominic Cruz. Like he loves that Willie Pep type of like V footwork where he's bending forward until Henry Cejudo throws a knee at your head. Okay, that could cause some major issues. And the more and more Piotr Jan presses forward, that's what that's what he does. He might be able to crowd Corey Sanhagen here. Again, Piotr Jan, the best the best weapon that he has is his forward pressure. He doesn't necessarily get fighters too concerned with the power. Yeah, he does have knockout power, but it's his forward pressure. He's always in your face. He doesn't give you a chance to breathe. And yeah, he might be able to catch Corey Sanhagen with one of his big shots. And the best the best weapon that he's got, in my opinion, is his ability to cover distance in such an efficient manner. Of course, Sanhagen, on the other hand, is able to do the same thing. He can hit you at a very long range, but Piotr Jan can cover distance a lot better because he's ambidextrous. He's... Very powerful in both of his hands. He could throw an overhand right from his power side from the orthodox, step over, and throw a big overhand left from the southpaw, and it's got the same power. That's that's like a superhero right there, okay? that's I would dream for that, to be ambidextrous. My left hand, it's only good for jabs. That's it. I don't have power in that hand, unless I catch you with a solid left hook or something. That's it, okay? Best case scenario. If I was able to switch stances... And throw a huge overhand right. It reminds me of Gennady Golovkin. He kind of does the same thing. That is such a cool thing. Alfred, I'll put money on a here and a hooker. I appreciate it, uh, Alfred. Thank you very much. But just, you've been warned, okay? You've been warned, all right? <laughs> Piotr Jan by knockout. I think you're just disagreeing. It's a joke. It was a joke, my man. Put my money on that hooker. Uh, Makachev by submission. Okay, good, good. Thank you very much for your donation. I got the thing working now. Look at that. But thank you very much, Michael Alfred. Piotr Jan by knockout. That's a possibility. But the thing is, who has been able to outstrike Corey Sanhagen? The answer is nobody. Nobody's been able to outstrike Corey Sanhagen. A lot of the arguments are kind of, are, maybe it's not arguments, but a lot of people all think Piotr Jan's champion right now when he's not, okay? It's Aljamain Sterling. Let's just make that very clear right now. And just because Corey Sanhagen lost Aljamain Sterling in dramatic fashion, doesn't mean he's going to lose to Piotr Jan in dramatic fashion. I think that's where a lot of people get their heads twisted a little bit. That, that's why they automatically assume Piotr Jan. And I was kind of the same way too. And everybody loves Piotr Jan. Corey Sanding is a savage too. Like This, this is kind of heart-wrenching, honestly, from a fan's perspective. But I, I really think in the stand-up department, Corey Sanding has way more weapons than Piotr Jan in this fight. Way more. And I've been... 
I've counted out Piotr Jan way too many times, to be quite honest with you. I thought Sterling was going to pick or was going to win. I was right, man. I was right on that one. I freaking nailed it. But I was right. I thought Alzheimer Sterling was going to win. I, I didn't think Uriah was going to win, to be fair. Uh, I thought Josie Aldo was going to beat him. And also, um, going back to that, another reason why I kind of feel a little bit more towards Corey Sand. This fight was bound to happen eventually, okay? I really thought that the Grand Prix tournament, really, I thought Corey Sandhagen and Aljamain Sterling should have been for the World Championship instead of Piotr Jan and Josie Aldo. Part of that reason, Josie Aldo was 0-1 in the division, okay? It wasn't because of anything Piotr Jan did, but Piotr Jan did go from beating Uriah Faber to a World Championship fight. Corey Sandhagen was on a long winning streak at the time. And same with Aljamain Sterling. I thought they deserved the title fight more than Piotr Jan and Josie Aldo. Since then, it might have been um, might have been wrong. I throw money on worse, LOL. I, I, I guess, man. Uh, I got a left hook that'll stop a mule. That seems like, I don't, I don't know, you're not quoting Piotr Jan, but that seems like something he would say, man. Th that's just a terrifying thing. Uh, Yoda won. Okay, but that being said, I do think he's going to leave himself susceptible to a lot of the major power shots. And again, I went into way more depth on this. Um, and I made a lot of arguments for Piotr Jan, made a lot more arguments for Corey Sanhagen. So if you guys are more interested, if you guys want to watch that, please watch my video. It's about 30 minutes long. Watch that. Broke it down. But my official prediction, Corey Sanhagen via unanimous decision. Um, even though my my brain's kind of, my gut's telling me Corey Sanhagen. And I, my, I went with my gut many times, but I'm picking Sanhagen by decision here. That's my official prediction. I'm really thinking a knockout, but I do think he's going to land some big shots on Piotr Jan. Piotr Jan has been dropped before, albeit momentarily against Ja Dotson. And that was when he was doing that. He, he threw an overhand right, stepped through with it, didn't respond with a left. I could be getting my left and rights mixed up here, but he was caught with a left hook by Ja Dotson, sent him down, but he popped right back up. I think Corey Sanhagen's going to be able to do that. I think he's going to be able to counter him pretty well. Look out for the flying knees. And Piotr Jan, even though he's got good takedowns, and that's Corey Sanhagen's weak point, Corey Sanhagen, or Piotr Jan's not going to try to follow up with it. Corey Sanhagen is way too, way better than him on the ground. Okay, I don't think, or at least in jiu-jitsu that is. I think it's way more dangerous for Piotr Jan on the ground than it is on the feet. Uh, so I think the jiu-jitsu jiu game, not only just the jiu-jitsu game, because uh, he's not the best grappler, Corey Sanhagen. Operator, thank you very much for your donation, brother. Would really love to see belts, whoever's his... UFC tournament. No, it will never, ever, ever happen. They co UFC co-promoted one time. And it didn't go good. Thank you very much, operator. Did not go great for him. That was when Chuck Liddell went over to Pride. And then he loses to Quentin Rampage Jackson. And then Rampage gets knocked out by Vandalay Silva. Didn't go good for the UFC there. So that's why they don't do it anymore. Would love to see a fight between Vadim Nemkov. Well, depending on... I would love to see the winner of Vadim Nemkov and Corey Anderson fight Jan Lahovich in the future. I really do. But that's a complete side note. So speaking of that, I'm going with Corey Sandhagen via unanimous decision. I do think he's going to hit Piotr Jan a lot. So even though my heart's kind of telling me or my gut's telling me Corey Sandhagen via knockout, I'm not quite sure in a realistic sense if he's going to be able to hit a perfect shot and hit knockout Piotr Jan. So I think he's going to hit him repeatedly on the back foot, and maybe even pressure Piotr Jan. I, I don't remember the last time, and I've watched his entire UFC career, I don't think he's ever been put on the back foot. Uh, but if he does take a back step, Corey Sanhagen's going to have his way with him. Uh, so I do think Corey Sanhagen in this fight, taking the underdog here, Corey Sanhagen, the interim champion, We sh and then we'll have the title fight that really should have happened in the first place with Jaldemir Sterling and uh, Corey Sanhagen. All right, and in the main event of the evening, I'm going Jan Blachowicz. Um, via early knockout. Uh, go over to Shira. The big, the big deciding factor is, there we go. We're, we're now live. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, that was really weird. It keeps happening, man. Hopefully that fixes itself by fr by Saturday. Okay. Bursting the fight as long as Jan Blachowicz doesn't punch himself out. That's going to be one of the major factors. Can Jan Blachowicz put away Glover to Shira in the early going? That's going to be... One of the major questions that needs to be asked, and if it can't, cue ball, thank you. Yeah, it is It is buffering. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Faber's be best years were spent at WC. You're absolutely right. Yeah, so sorry about that. Anyway, um, yeah, most likely possibility. I do think Yambo Hovich is going to crack Glover to share. Now, to be fair, Glover to share did eat a clean shot from Tiago Santos and survived. 
I'm not sure if he's going to be able to survive it against Polish Power. Uh, Polish Power gets on top of Glover to share. I don't think he has much answer off his back. So, Jan Blachowicz via early knockout. I went through a lot of other possibilities. You guys are interested, but that's all I got. Operator, thank you very much. Using Starlink? No, I'm using worse than that. Bungo Wireless. It's the only option that I got here. But thank you guys so much for watching. Operator, again, thank you very much. It hasn't popped up on... Uh, it hasn't popped up here yet, but thank you very much. That's all I got for you guys. That's UFC 267. Absolutely stacked fight card. We're very blessed. It's the most stacked fight night in UFC history. There, there will never be another fight card. Like, I mean, think about it. We have two of some of those exciting weight classes right now, which is crazy to say that light heavyweight's exciting because that just hasn't been the case in many years. But here we go. And we finally have a number one contender fighting for early. This is the way it should be. This is a real title fight right here, which we don't see very often anymore. We finally have a number one contender fighting the world champion. Just things have worked out. Okay. We have an interim championship where two fighters are coming off of losses. I mean, to be fair, Sanhagen won and well, Piotr Jan lost, but whatever. <laughs> Just love that, man. Anyway, guys, hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Um, I will not see you guys tomorrow. I have to cancel that stream. Get my MRI done on my knee. So hopefully, I mean, I... It sounds weird, but I hope they find something so I can get it fixed because I know something's wrong with it. <laughs> okay, so hopefully, knock on wood there. I'm going to get an MRI on my knee. My, my knee's fine. I think I have a torn meniscus. I almost certainly know I do just based on my own medical knowledge. and just I, I know what's up with my knee. Something's wrong with it. I, it keeps locking up, but it caused me zero pain, but that's a complete side note. So I will not see you guys tomorrow. So I will see you guys live bright and early Saturday morning. It's Tyler from T1MA. I'll catch you guys later.